give you once again the kingdom, the power, and the glory belongs to you, all the honor, all the adoration. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, what you are, what you have done, and what you will yet do. We pray by your spirit that even as we commence this program, <coughs> that you will take preeminence and do what only you can do. We open up our hearts as an altar between earth and heaven. Also this place, we consecrate it and dedicate it unto you uh, in, in great expectation of what you will do with us and through us and for us in the United Kingdom. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a powerful hand clap. Hallelujah. Can you please also, as we sit down, let's appreciate Evans and Puris, the boy, and Sons of Liberty. Come on, let's appreciate them. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 He may be seated in his mighty presence and tell your neighbor, say, you're blessed to be sitting next to me this Tuesday evening. Amen. And then tell them it's good that you can make it. Amen. So, without taking any more of our time, I want us to go straight into our program. You're welcome to this program. Uh, it's called the Strategic Prayer and Intercession Workshop. Tell your neighbor, say, you're welcome. Yes, and um, it's the first of its kind. Now, I'm not the kind that would start a program and then it has to be annual. We don't, we don't have to pay that subscription. So we don't, we don't know what will happen next year, but that's, I believe that this one is ordered and ordained by God and there's something that God wants to do. Hallelujah. And I'm praying that your heart will be open. Uh, are you, is your heart going to be open? Uh, and, and also your mind will be open and that um, whatever... Um, God wants to do that you'll be ready to receive it and that it will bring a shift in your life, in your families, in your destiny. Hallelujah. Amen. So, I mean, for those of you who know, um, we have a guest all the way from, um, I was going to say restaurant, all the way from, all the way from Manchester, you can, you can tell what's on my mind. <laughs> yeah. We have a guest all the way from Manchester, I don't know whether I, to call him pastor, apostle, intercessor, but he's something. I'm just doctor, uh, James Aladron, and he's going to be, you know, ministering alongside uh, uh, me tonight on a very pertinent topic. And so please sit tight, okay? And um, just to let you know, I mean, we've been planning this program. Uh, well, maybe when I do introduce him, I'll, I'll give a bit more of a background. But I want, us, I want to delve straight into our session because uh, what, we're, what we're grappling with today is very significant. And I believe if we can understand it, it's going to shift and change uh, the way we view prayer and by the grace of God, also the way we get results. Uh, can somebody say, this is my year of experiencing growth and seeing extraordinary results. Okay, so um, like I will usually do at this com um, conferences and meetings, so I, I take the first session to set the scene, the context and the reason why we're doing what we're doing. And then um, we would also bring uh, James and then, uh, then we take it from there. Turn your Bibles very quickly with me to um, two or three openings. They are short scripture verses, three of them. The first being in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 22 to 26. And it says, then the Lord said to Moses, I want you to take, you know, full cognizance of the things that are going to be said in the scriptures. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel or to the church in this, in 21st century, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven, which means God does speak to people from heaven. Okay. You shall not make anything to be with me, as in, you shall not make any idols to represent me, you know, gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves, which means you can approach me directly. You don't need any idols, okay? 
And then he says, but this you shall do, an altar of earth, this was in the Old Testament, you shall make for me, which means if you want to communicate with me, you, this, is, this is how you can reach out to me. This, this is my phone number, you know, for want of a better illustration. And you shall sacrifice on it, which means if you ever want me to talk to you or you want my help, you know, it will require sacrifice. Your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. And then he says, in every place where I record my name, which means in those days, they were actually designated place, places, which were, in a sense, that God, in a sense, chose as altar points. He says, then I will come to you and I will bless you. Now, this is the Old Testament, and this is God giving prescriptions on how they could communicate with him. How many of you know we, that we have a better covenant under better promises? But he doesn't do away with the supposed pattern of prescription. You know, so this is giving us guidance that if you're going to approach God or you want God to speak to you, that there are certain things that need to, 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 to take place. Even though we don't need to do it, you know, um, uh, build it, an altar of earth, you have to build an altar, okay? And then there has to be sacrifices. Then he says in Leviticus 24, verse 1 to 3, and he says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, uh, you tell somebody next to you, say, uh, I, I, I know God will speak to you soon. Then he says, command the children of Israel, okay? Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil. Somebody say pure oil. Pure oil. Which means not desecrated, not polluted, not diluted. Pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lambs burn continually. Tell somebody next to you, say your lamb must burn continually. And it has to be pure oil, unpolluted and undiluted. And then he says in verse 3, Aaron or Aaron shall be in charge of it, which means somebody must be in charge of it. There must be a priest in place. From evening until when? Morning, before the Lord continually. Tell your neighbor, say, your altar needs a priest. Uh, no, I need you to tell them and say it with, they say, your altar needs a priest. <laughs> Not your pastor, your old altar needs what? A priest. Okay. And then let's look at the last scripture verse. This is rare, but it happens sometimes that I'll give you a third one. Uh, but it's also short. It's in Exodus 30 verse 7. And it says, Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense. How many times? Oh, you, oh, you guys can't read it. How? Every Sunday. I, are you sure? Every Sunday. When he tends the lamp, he shall what? Burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps of, uh, at twilight, which means also in the evening, he shall burn incense on it. What? A perpetual. Somebody say perpetual. Perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations, which means every morning will be from generation to generation. It is my prayer that uh, uh, God will find priests in your family, Amen. that God will find priests in your generation Amen. that will continually burn incense on their altar Amen. perpetually from generation to generation. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Father, Lord, we pray by your spirit that you would open our hearts, open our eyes, open our understanding, most importantly, open our destinies to what it is you want to impute into our hearts and into our, into our lives. And we're praying that nobody will leave this place the same. Those who are here physically, who've taken out time, made the sacrifice, and those who are online, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone. This evening, I'm going to be sharing on a topic um, you know, in this strategic prayer and intercession workshop on raising powerful altars and being or becoming effective priests. The reason why I am talking about raising powerful altars is because, uh, unfortunately, there are powerless altars. And the sad thing about powerful and powerless altars is that they are altars. So 
they look the same. <laughs> and you can't quite tell the difference. You know, if I had time, but I really don't, but I'll just mention, um, um, when, 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 when Solomon's son, Rehoboam, um, messed up and God was unhappy with him, he tore the kingdom into, into two. God divided the kingdom. Long story short, gave it to, uh, a part of it to someone else. And there were, the guy who they gave, um, I think it was the Judah part of the kingdom, the two, one, one part of the kingdom to was a gangster. He, 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 he was, he was, he was, he was just, he, he, he wasn't, he wasn't a, a, a really godly guy. He was very political. But for whatever reason, God gave it to him. He tore the kingdom. And you know what? In order to ensure that the people of Judah would, would not go to the original kingdom to keep their hearts towards him, he built two altars. He built one at Bethel and built the other one at, uh, where was it? Was it Dan? Somebody please correct me if you remember the precise, I think it's Dan. And he set up those altars. They were, they were more his own construction. And you will find from scripture that, you know, people just went there to worship at those altars. They were powerless altars. But the one that was actually originally ordained by God between the two, the Bethel altar, God defended that altar. The one that, was, that he just constructed, Nothing happened at that altar. And it is my prayer that you will not end up worshiping at a man-made altar. One that God does not back. Now, it's important as we go into this session to understand when we say strategic prayer, some people will say, well, these are nice sounding names. What, what was this all about? Yeah. Just so that you understand context, the word strategy, for you to say something is strategic, strategic, you know, the, the word strategy or strategy comes from the root word strategy, which is a plan of action designed to achieve a major or overall aim. And so when you say something is strategic, it's saying that, look, we're going to be looking at prayer and intercession from a viewpoint of God's overall plan. Now, the reason why it was called strategic and not prophetic, which we could have said, is, you know, because... You, many of you, when we say prophetic, you will come and say, okay, they're going to prophesy to me. Uh, you, you are thinking personally. <laughs> you know, you are thinking that uh, this is about me, this is about, about my situation. Even though prophetic should be strategic. Is this making sense? Yeah. But there's a reason why we say strategic because even though God wants to meet your needs, when God meets your needs, it's, it's all part of an overall plan. And, and this, these prayers that we want to teach you is how... You fit in that overall plan. Another word for strategy is the process of creating well-aligned activities. Somebody say well-aligned. Activities with the aim of occupying a valuable position in a well-defined competitive landscape. This is a lot of jargon to just essentially say that, you know, that, you know, that when you think strategic, there's usually a, 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 a big, an overall plan. Does that make sense? And, and there are, the aligned activities are various things that need to be done to achieve that thing. Does that make sense? So when, when, when armies go to war, before they put their foot on, boots on the ground, the generals plan a strategy. And they say, okay, we send in this first, we send in that. Any army that goes to war without strategy has lost the war. And then what happens is that they begin to roll out the plan. The sad thing is that most of us are not connected with God's overall plan. And we're, we're just saying, I, I need some machine guns. I need some boots. Why? Because I want to deal, I want to, I want to deal with the things that are affecting my, my breakthrough. No, God doesn't just hand guns to people. Yeah. He, there's a strategic plan, and, and you will understand what I'm saying. Now, what is God's strategic? What is his overall plan? Now, um, for us as a church... It's about the mission. Our overall aim is to empty hell and make heaven full. To, is, this make it, is this clear? Make hell empty and populate heaven. And to make progress by taking territory. Somebody say take territory. take territory. And explain what I mean by that. So essentially, you are part of that plan. And you will see how your, the personal prophetic thing fits in. For God to take territory, he needs to take you as an individual to take over your life, and then he also needs to take over your family. Uh, and you know your family is a mess. I mean, even if you don't tell anybody. Yeah, I, see, I, see. I mean, you know what I mean? What I'm saying is that if you, there's, a, there's a dysfunction somewhere. 
at least one. <laughs> you know, and so not everything is aligned with heaven. Hello, okay, even if the rest of your family is okay, you are not. <laughs> And so, <laughs> I mean, that wasn't meant to be an insult. It was, it, it, it's an admonition, actually. You, but that, that, you, so, <laughs> the Bible says that we should pray that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And why I say you are not is that, are you doing all of God's will on earth as it is in heaven? Okay, so alignment is ensuring that we become, does that make sense? And so, taking territory, I mean, if you looked honestly, not everything in your family is going as it should. So when we talk about taking territory, you know, um, we, we're talking about praying prayers that will ensure your, your family aligns. Then when we talk about taking territory, there's taking territory of, okay, Woodford, your community, where you live, your neighborhood. Okay, if your family is all in order, is your neighborhood in order? Okay, is your country in order? Is the NHS in order? Okay, so what I'm saying essentially is that we have our work cut out, isn't it? And so it's, it's strategy is about an overall aim, taking territory, and uh, I'm going to break it down a bit. And it's also uh, about a plan of action, well-aligned activities. And in, if you're going to take territory, there are certain things, there's a plan, there are certain things, and part of that plan is one, prayer. Somebody say prayer. Yeah. And not just ordinary prayer, altar building prayers because if you're going to take over your family listen to this from the teachings we've been doing in the last few weeks you'll find that there are altars yeah that are contending they are the ones responsible for the dysfunction of your family they are the reasons why people end up in divorce there's the reason why people die prematurely prematurely there's the reason why people end up on drugs and you see a pattern and so when we're talking about strategic prayers, we're saying, what are the aligned activities, the tactics? There are going to be things like prayer, prophecy, discipleship, etc. So in this plan, tonight we're going to take one part of it. And we're talking about how to build effective prayer altars. Strategic and prophetic intercession. Let me break it down to you, for you. The three dimensions, there, there could be more. Why you and I need an intercession? First of all, we need what, what I call advancing intercession. Somebody say advancing. advancing. You know, we Christians are very oblivious to the fact that there are two realms. You know, so we just move into houses. We say, I want, we're moving into this neighborhood for better schools. This and that. Fair enough. You know, you know, but if I had time, I would explain some things to you. But I remember um, um, a number of years ago, <laughs> we have, so we have this thing called Breakthrough Night. You know, um, some of you are, are conversant with that. And it's a Friday meeting, prophetic meeting, supernatural prayer, breaking things, curses, blah, blah, blah. So we did this on Friday. And by Sunday, one lady, she's actually, she used to be one of my leaders, came up to me and said, Pastor, <laughs> I went to bed Friday night, Saturday, um, um, Friday into Saturday, I had a dream. And now watch this very carefully. She just moved into the house. In fact, she, she actually called me to, or something, she wanted me to pray on the house or something like that. She just moved into the house literally like the week prior. And she said she slept, and that when she slept, in the, in the middle of the night, she had a dream that a man was biting her arm. Serious, and she woke up, you know, she was struggling in the and when she woke up, she looked at her, at her arm and lit, there were real physical bite marks. She didn't see the man <laughs> when she woke up, but she saw the marks. So how many of you know that that was not a... I, don't, that, I call that virtual reality. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually not a dream. I mean, if I told you some things that happened where, I mean, <laughs> I mean I'll keep some discreet, but... Where people have dreams, and it's like, did that happen or did not? Did it not? But it will even confound you more when same people are living in the same house, they have exactly the same kind of dream at the same time. Did you see that thing that came? Yes. 
I just, I just had a dream. And so, 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 and so, I saw this animal come. Oh, I just had the same dream. So how many of you know that it wasn't a dream? It was actually, that's actually what you call a vision or a trance. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. Listen to this. How many of you know that that woman moved into that house? She, she's paying the mortgage, but she doesn't really own that house. Because I asked the lady, I said, she was like, Pastor, I don't understand. I said, well, what happened is that you just came from a prophetic program and it opened your senses. And so what you did is you carried the presence from here and, and then it showed you who really is in who owns the house. It's called a strong man. And then she was like, well, why would I? I said, well, how did it go? I said, well, you know what? When you were cleaning up the house, did you see, find any books or any kind of... They say, yeah, 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 actually, I remember. She saw these books with some funny writings and this, and they look like hieroglyphics and blah, 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 some occultic. And she, I said, what did you do? She just, I just threw it away. How many of you know that if you just throw away the books, it doesn't throw away the spirit? And so I told her what to do, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she's been living in that house since then. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. <laughs> she took over the house but didn't take over the territory. And there are people who have died because she was even fortunate to have been at a meeting that was prophetic that opened up her senses to see who the real landlord was. And I mean, I'll give another quick scenario. But when we just moved into, you know, when we started this church, six months into starting the church, we got a building. Just literally 200 years from the hotel, we, you know, somebody just said, do you want a building? Uh, Bupa just left, do you want this? So we got it. We did it all, blah, blah, blah. And the first day we had a worship, real, you know, who remembers? Really powerful worship and prayer, blah, blah, blah. And we danced and all of that and claimed the place and all of that. That night I had a visitation. Some funny looking men with big bellies. Yes. And, and they had this eye painted on their, you know, like, what do they call that thing now? The, yes, on their whatever. I didn't, you know. And, you know, they came to me in the dream, and one of them, the boss, held my hand and said, who, who gave you that land? Who gave you that? How, how did you get the land? I, I was like, what? And then I noticed he was trying to read my palms. He was, he was holding my hand, trying to kind of get information. And I just pulled my hand away, and I broke off, as it were. And then woke up, long story short, I realized that those are the landlords of that land. This is in Canary Wharf. I did not understand until about a year or two later when I traveled to Mexico. And I, we went to a place, this Maya, you know, they have these pyramids and all of that. And we saw some men. They were just like those guys, naked, they were half naked, belly out, and had the same. I'd never traveled to Mexico before, never seen those men before. I saw them in my dream. And then... I then studied a bit more, and I found out what was in the, it was what you call the eye of Horus. Horoscope. That is what, that's the spirit behind divination. And if you go to Canary Wharf, you will see a pyramid like this. What's the name of that thing? Cabot uh, building. And you see on the top, a pyramid like in Mexico. And at the top, there's an eye. There's a, there's a light that flashes. What am I trying to say? Listen to this. It means that what I sense, what I felt in the spirit was essentially God showing me what, who really owned the terrain. That even though we had a long lease in this place, somebody else was the landlord and was contending with us. And say, who gave you this land? What am I trying to say? Listen to this. Some of you think you own your own lives. <laughs> and that's why I said, See, some of you, your lives are not, even though you are Christians and you've been saying, I am the head and not the tail, but you keep being the tail. Because there's another landlord. And if you are going to <laughs> truly become all God has destined for you to be, you have to get involved in intercession. And when I say, some of you want to get married, some of you want to have children, and, you know, some of you, all of us want to live long. <laughs> but something, somebody else is saying that you could, cannot go beyond the age of your father. Or you cannot go beyond so-so and so. 
And so this is why I will show you. The first is what I call advancing intercession, which is when you take a new property, when you take a new wife, well, you only have one to take. You, 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 you take a, a new spouse, listen to this, to when you advance in, you have to neutralize or bind the strong man behind that place. If not, it will not, for, it will not remain yours. The second is pro protective intercession. Somebody say protective. Now, this is the kind of intercession that when you are going about your own business, you are, doing, you are not trying to advance anything because, you know, there's a saying, it's not scripture, but it's new levels, new devils. The devil did not come and show up to Jesus when he was in the carpenter's yard making uh, Ikea furniture for people in, in, in Israel. Yeah. He only came when the, he was announced and began to negotiate. And so in the, same, in the same light, you know, there's something called protective intercession, which is essentially if you are going to be anything for God or do anything for God, Satan will attack you. And he will attack your family. Oh, no, no. I mean, the people he doesn't attack are the people who are already with him. And advancing his course. Okay? And so, what is protective intercession? I mean, on Sunday, I mentioned the fact that just a few days ago, I was sleeping, minding my own business. There's something, there's not like minding your own business when you're a Christian. A real Christian. Because there's no demilitarized zone. When you, the day you became a Christian, a real Christian, unless you are, you know, you are a dual citizen. You are, you are, you know, you know, you are, you know, you are Christian on Sunday nightclub on, you know, so they say this is ours. Don't touch them. You know, this person is advancing our kingdom already. Yeah. So if you are a real Christian, listen to this. There's, there's going to be bull's eye on your bum. And so, now, <laughs> on your backside, and, and the, the, are you here tonight? So th there's something called protective intercession. What's that? So I slept and then woke up. In the, I, I was really tired, barely slept two hours. I, would, I, I woke up from my sleep. And as I was waking up, I saw a vision, clear. I saw a massive tree, and God said, that is like T.D. Jakes. And then the Lord said, begin to pray for him. Why? Because I saw five witches. It's, it's almost like it, that tree had five roots, and they were, they were attacking the roots. Listen to this. I said, Lord, T.D. Jakes doesn't know me. <laughs> he doesn't send me any uh, uh, income. Or, you know, he, don't, he, he doesn't. He don't, I don't have any. What? He said, God said, pray for him. So I was really tired, but I was praying, praying, praying. And within five or so minutes of prayer, I saw, um, um, what do they call that thing? There? Almost like a hologram, it seemed like. In my room, somebody just showed up, wearing white. And it was a fetish priest. And I said, who's that? He said, that's the one who is praying against, who is, who, is, who is cursing you. And he's standing, and I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? He said, well, when you started praying for T.D. Jakes, it opened you up to, for me to show you what is against you. So, and I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? He said, well, the same way they are praying against T.D. Jakes and the roots, they are also doing for you. So I then began to say, okay, so what, whatever T.D. Jakes may be going through now, it means that I need to deal with some stuff. So that, that's why the Lord actually, actually showed me that some stuff that may want to rock later, this is what you call protective intercession. Lift up your right hand wherever you are saying, in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare, I will be awoken. My life will be awoken and alive to advancing intercession, to take territory, and, and I will be awoken and energized into protective intercession. Then the third is this, reclaiming intercession. And, and what do I mean by this? Reclaiming intercession is essentially when Satan feels he owns the, your territory already. And your, it could be your family. And you see patterns in your family. You know, a pattern of insanity, pattern of drug addiction. Somebody in the family, you know, that kind of thing. Pattern of premature death, pattern of divorce. And you're like, okay, what is this? 
How do we deal with this? Reclaiming is, you want to reclaim your bloodline so that it aligns with God's strategic purposes. How many of you would like to do that? And listen to this. Now, let me tell you what my ministry is and what I am praying. And this is, this is my calling. I am a prophetic intercessor. And my, my you know, um, my prayer, or let me put it this way, my mandate is to raise as many prophetic intercessors as possible. Now, thank God for intercession, but the, the, what prophetic intercession does is, the things I'm sharing with you, you know, intercessors, people who have a calling for just pure intercession, they are, they are graced to pray. They can pray more than anybody. They have a passion to pray, blah, blah, blah. Prophetic intercession is more targeted. Because what happens is that God opens your eyes to show you what the real target is. I could have been praying for TD Jakes, but I, with prophetic intercession, they showed me where the real challenge was. Is this making sense? The lady who, you know, um, had that man bite her, as it were, the bite mark and all of that, you know, the reason, what happened with her was prophetic intercession. She was in an atmosphere be, the night before that was prophetic. So it took her to the place to show her what her real problem was. If she wasn't in that kind of program, she would have just been having all sorts of bites and things, waking up and seeing Max and not understanding what it was about. Okay, but because also she was in a prophetic church, she got the interpretation that this is what it is. Somebody in the occult had built altars in the house that invited that spirit. Now, when we speak about, is it uh, um, reclaiming intercession? This is essentially about, you know, a strong man, the same way that that spirit was invited into that lady's house by somebody who had some occulted books and did some incantation and built an altar in that house that invited the spirit, somebody in your bloodline maybe made a covenant, possibly invited the spirit some years ago, um, generations past, and there is a spirit, the same way that, that that strong man or demonic spirit was in that house and biting people. Yeah, there may be in a, a spirit in your bloodline that is biting people. And defensive intercession is when, when God opens your eyes as you are praying, God begins to open your eyes to see the root. There's a, 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 I mean, this happened to my wife recently. When I started preaching about covenants within that period, if you remember, she led the prayers when I was away. And without giving a lot of detail, she just woke up like two or three days later. And she said, I saw somebody in my family that she hadn't seen in many years from another generation. Showed up to her and sat down beside her and told her, this is what we will do for you. But this will happen to you. But this will happen, you know. And when she told me, I said, are you serious? I said, just before you told me this, I was praying and preparing the message for Sunday. And this is the kind of thing God was talking to me about. Is this making sense? But you, listen to this. What happened to her is that, listen to this, that thing has always been there. She only just became aware to, of it because of the prophetic grace that is there. And in this period, you will find that some of you will have some, would, be, would have been having dreams. Has anybody had some strange dream in recent times? Put up your, put it boldly. See, can you see? Yeah, because, because of the teaching and, the, and what it is is that it's an advantage to you. Don't be scared of it. It is almost like ultrasound or x-ray to know where the problem is and how to address it. Or let's put it this, to know where the problem is, then I'm going to tell you how to address it shortly. Lift up your right hand wherever you are. Say, in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare, I am reclaiming every lost territory in my family, in my life, in the name of Jesus. You know, one of our members, she's one, now one of our key leaders. She joined the church many years ago. Well, about eight, nine years ago. And a few months or whatever into joining the church, I just came to church one day. I, I didn't realize I had a dream. And I saw myself being taken to a, a place called Kutonu. Kutonu is the next uh, republic of the next country to Nigeria. Now, I was in the dream when I was, like, I was arguing with myself. I said, what does this person have anything? You know, I know the states that she's, I know the, 
the town that her and her, both herself and her husband are from the same town, the same, um, not village town. <laughs> so, but I did something really, I should have asked her before the service, but it just came to me during the service. I said, I, I had a dream where I saw myself being taken to Kotonu and cons- on your behalf, and I saw somebody digging like graves and putting, bearing some, some sacrifices on your behalf in Kotonu. She said, her mom's mom is from Kotonu. How many of you know that it can only be a spirit that gives you that information? Now, that spirit, for that, that's the Holy Spirit, you have to have an altar. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. And, and when they reveal that to you, what do you do? Now, remember, this is about what? Strategic what? What did I say? Strategic what? Yes. So the question is, what is intercession? Intercession means to intercede, to act, interpose, or intervene on behalf of someone in difficulty or trouble as by pleading or petition, to, like to intercede with the governor for a condemned man. You know, uh, the governor just, I mean, the, the, the state just condemned the person and he said, please, you know, look, show mercy, clemency, as it were. That is what the advocate or the whatever will be saying, this person is supposed to die, but please, you know. So an intercessor is, is like a lawyer, okay? And this is why God said in Ezekiel 22, 30, so I sought for a man amongst them. Somebody say amongst them. them. Not a man from the pastor. From amongst them who who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I did what found none. Are you listening to this? So there are two sides. I, I talked about prophetic intercession. I've just told you about the prophetic side. Now, this is the intercession side. That when you see what you see and you say, oh, this is the problem, what can you do about it? What, what we, now you know there's a, there's a man who you can't see that is biting people. <laughs> now that you know that there's a man, if, some fat belly people with the eye of horrors, what do you do about it? Uh, now that you know that there's somebody bearing something in Kodono, what do you do about it? That's why, that's why God said, I sought for a man who will do what? Make a wall and stand it that I will not destroy it. It's not so much in this instance, it's so that this, this, this demonic entities will not destroy it. And so that they will not destroy the family. So let me tell you what it is. In the series that I've been preaching about, I talked about five, seven things. Who remembers? Number one, the altar. Number two, what? The covenant transaction. Number three, what? The agreement. Number four, the sacrifice. Number five, the priesthood. Number six, visitation. Number seven, they look for renewal. So I want to talk about, first of all, number five. You cannot have an altar your altar cannot be active if there's no priesthood. Let me explain what I mean. <laughs> uh, I know you've been to work and you're tired, but please don't let your mind be tired. Who is a priest? You see, that vision that I saw, the dream, where God opened my eyes to see somebody bearing something in Kotonu, it means the priesthood is still active. And the Lord was, was telling me that, hey, you better wake up, that this person is under your care now, and you are a prophet, so you, this is why I brought this person to this place. Help them understand that there, there is a, an active priesthood at an altar that is speaking against you. And God is saying, I'm looking for someone who will be active on this side. Sadly, most people want to outsource it to their pastor. It doesn't work like that. Who is a priest? A priest is a person whose office is to perform religious rites. Yes. Sacrificial. So that's why they say, but pastor, that's your job. No. My job is to teach you how to perform the rites yourself. And I'll show you in a short while. That's the problem. You want to employ somebody else. And then the sad thing is that you don't even pay the pastor enough for that kind of job. You, you abuse the pastors. Talk about them stealing the test, and then you tell them to pray for you again. But that's another story for another day. <laughs> Not tonight. 
a, a, a priest is a gatekeeper between the natural or human, human and supernatural divinity realm. <laughs> Are you here tonight? And when we talk about raising powerful altars, we're talking about priests, priests who can communicate with the spirit realm via altars. This is, I'm not talking about employing a consultant. I'm not talking about employing a project manager, which is what we want to do in church. And just organize good programs. I'm talking, who is going to deal with that man biting people? <laughs> Are you listening to what I'm saying? Who is going to deal with that man? You know who's going to deal with the person sacrificing that thing? An altar without a priest will remain docile, ineffective, and powerless. Sadly, the enemy's altar is effective, energized, and powerful, but ours has become docile. Because you know what? We have neglected our priesthood. We have neglected our priesthood. Listen to this. If preachers don't have power, they are no different from lecturers. Yeah, they are no different from that sociology lecturer or psychology lecturer. Yeah, yes. And the sad thing is, you know what? The church has become like that. We have become, we've become full of lecturers. Listen to this. This is just a platform now, and you, we, there's no difference between Brian Tracy and Pastor Brian. There's no difference between Anthony Robbins and Pastor Tony. Yeah, they, 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 they just weave words. They're, is this making sense? They, they, and they, they, they make decrees. They say, oh, I decree, but you know what? Powerless. And you go back to your house and the man is still biting you. And this is, this is a call to everyone because now we're laughing. You know what? I, so, oh, I wish I could really deal with this matter. I'm, I'm really speeding. But the, the point is, is, listen to this. Somebody was saying, oh, what about the people who lay hands and pray? Yeah. I said, they are, they are, we all have to wake up. We all have to wake up. Really. I, stop looking at the people here. You are called to be... That's what the Bible says. We are supposed, supposed to be called to be a kingdom of priests. Every one of us, First Peter 2, offering up spiritual sacrifices. And an altar, that means every one of us has to have an altar. An altar must have someone. It must have a priest servicing it with something regularly, subscriptions. And, and very unfortunately, the kingdom of darkness, they are so powerful at doing this. The altar of God must be stronger than any other evil altar. What powers an altar? An altar is like a power station connecting two worlds. So if you want the Lord to deliver you from the power of idols and evil altars erected in, in your soul or generational bloodline, you must make sure that you practice spiritual disciplines like praying and fasting on a regular basis. Is anybody home? Very quickly, if I can do this, I'll try and do it quickly. Four things, four areas that, that make sure that your altar is powerful. Would you like to find out? What makes you, what, 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 what these four things, if you do these four things, this, is, this, this will ensure that you are different, you are, not, you are not like a lecturer. And also that you don't become a casualty. That when, when, you, when you get home, demonic entities will know that ah, somebody has arrived. The first thing is this. There is a cost. There are forces. There is a, there's a cost to generating altar power. And that cost is sacrifice. Somebody say sacrifice. There is no, there is no altar. There is no real altar without a sacrifice. I told you, I saw that vision. The, what I was seeing was the, the, whoever in the family was in Kotonou, but it, it, it was a sacrifice they were making. And it was a big one. You know, and so there is no, and you, if you are not making any sacrifices, you, you know what, I'll show you in a short one. This is what it says in Judges 16 verse 23. Some of you might have read this story before. It said, now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great, a what? A what? 
a small sacrifice to Dagon their God. Now, when the church calls for sacrifice, we give the barest minimum. And sacrifice is not just money. Money is one of it. But this is why other religions buy up buildings faster than we do because we are not ready to give great sacrifices. Is this making sense? But beyond that, listen to this. When we say great sacrifice, we are talking about also sacrifice in terms of prayer, time, fasting. Listen to this. If the Muslims, look, I, I, I salute the commitment of Muslims. They are Ramadan, they don't mess with it. They won't fight with you during Ramadan. Afterwards, they can, they, they can abuse you afterwards. But, but, you know, but they, they don't mess with their Ramadan. They don't mess with their prayer time. They have watches five times a day and all of that. You just say, grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God. And then you just bounce and just wear your sneakers and you say, the, the grace covers me. This grace will follow you. Ah. <laughs> yeah, because it's, look, <laughs> the, the Bible says they, 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 gone offer, they offered a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. The great sacrifice was for one man. Look, why would God raise me to, to pray for T.D. Jakes? Why? Because there are probably not a lot of people praying for him. Meanwhile, there are a lot of witches trying to curse him. I don't know about what's going on in his life. I don't know. Do you understand? But God says that, you know, we, we, we kill our wounded. We, we go on social media, you'll see how people shred pastors. We are working too hard. If it wasn't that God called me, eh, with what people do to me, to us, I would have left since. I don't have time. I, I can be a businessman, though. I, took, I can drive private jet without being a pastor. I'm telling you, I have that kind of acumen. So what I am doing is, 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 I'm not looking for private jet, but you drive, look, this is, that's the reason why I drive a small car, because I don't want to insult. <laughs> that's one of the, but you see, but it's turning away my sons from me. But, like, but, but dad, why do you have to suffer? You are 50, going to be 55. Shouldn't you be enjoying yourself at this time in your life? So I say, oh, I'm not going to go that route because I want to drive whatever I want to drive. You're making sacrifices for you. <clears throat> the moral of the story, so you know, yeah, we say sacrifice. I've made a decision. If all I'm going to drive till I die is a year, is that so be it? It's a sacrifice. But you can drive whatever you want. And abuse us afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> now, the point is, the, the moral of the story is abundantly clear. Whoever carries the superior altar takes the day. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do this. Right. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time, but they're, they're ah, oh God. A very significant intercessor in, in Nigeria, my country of birth, mentioned this recently. He was quite close to the presidency at the time. There was an, a lot of attack on the president at the time. The president was a Christian one. And in the pre, pre, papers and all over, he was making a lot of mistakes. Everybody knew, even the child knew these guys making many mistakes. And they were, they were shredding him to pieces, shredding him to pieces. And then oh, suddenly, this, this man was there. So, he, he, went to, he went to what they, they call the villa. I've been there before, and, and, you know, when I went to visit the vice president. And they have something in the chapel. They, so the chaplain invited him. And then, you know, um, he, this person is the prayer man. And w during the whatever of the service, while conducting the service, he just noticed that the, he, he was saying a lot of fire prayers. Meanwhile, this chaplain is a Baptist, you know, a Baptist and whatever. They are not, you know, they, they are kind of prayers. I mean, they are great guys, but... And we're just saying, I fired this. I fired. And you know, the Pentecostal guys were like, ah, what happened to this Baptist? It's become a Baptist, a Baptist cost, costal, you know? <laughs> so at the end of the whatever, he goes up to him because they are friends. He says, ah, 
those prayers you are praying, we are, <laughs> where are from? He said, ah, he said, you know, there was some intelligence report that on a particular road in Nigeria, into Abuja, which is the um, capital, whatever, they discovered in one forest a, ma a large fire, and there were certain marabouts. They said there were 48 of them, who from four different countries, Mali, Senegal, Nigeria, and Republic of Benin, who had been put there. They put the photograph of this president on whatever, and they were saying, so, so, and so, error. So, so it's like saying, soon that error. Soon that error. Okay, let's use the past guy. Well, so, you know, touch your error, touch your error, touch your error. So that they don't say I'm saying, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know, you know what I mean? So, you know, and, you know, and the guy was making mistakes. So, so it was like, okay, so they saw that, and, and they said, these guys, when you, these marabouts, these are people who have not seen the sun for three years. That's how they are trained. Yes. And they are saying, and so, <laughs> when, they told, when they told this guy, so that's what he said, and that is what you say, after you finish prayer, you say it's concluded in 15 minutes prayer, you say it's done. <laughs> he laughed. <laughs> he said, <laughs> is that was, he said, you say it's done. He said, that's the problem with you Christians. He said, what do you mean? He said, to sort that out, you have to bring, those people are paying a price. You want to go and be eating rice. <laughs> what? What? You know, he said, look, how many did you say there were 48? He said, let's get 120 intercessors. And, and put them in a house somewhere. And, feed, and all they are doing is praying that the president will not make any errors. That's all. <laughs> look, the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 4, then the king went to Gibeon. You know, Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar in, in Gibeon. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night and said, ask me what I shall give you. Listen to this. Many of you, you are praying, but nothing has shown up. The reason why a man will rise up and come and buy that lady is because the, whoever lived in that house paid the price. You, there is a certain kind of a commitment that you make, need to make that will make God see that you are serious. Then he shows up and says, okay, what can I do for you? Somebody say the cost. Yeah, are you here? This is why in Acts 6, 3 to 4, he says, I'm giving you the New Testament now. Therefore, brethren, seek out from amongst you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. I don't want you to miss this. But then watch this. Everybody say business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, watch this. God spoke to me through this recently. Look, I turn 55 in a few, um, uh, a couple of days actually. And... Look, there's no way I also will not think about my own future. You know, I'm approaching 60, the whatever life, you know. So, ah, the same way I'm talking about you 10x in your income, I too want to take that. But if I try to 10x my own, I, can I even 2x it in this church? You will abuse me. Yes. <laughs> can I even one and a half? Maybe one or two will not. But you will say, so I have to start thinking of alternative sources of income for my own future. Isn't it? <laughs> I can't go back to medicine. Now, the point is this. I started thinking about it. Do you know, two weeks ago, sent some, God somebody, sent somebody who was an intercessor and he gave that, he told that person to give me a gift, a financial gift. And then he also, the person also had a, a vision. He said, God told, showed him this scripture, Acts 6. And he says, so that you can give yourself continually to prayer and the word. So we, that the Lord put it in his heart to take care of this business. And I just thought, wow, what God was saying to me. It's not that I shouldn't be there, but God said, God was saying that the devil can use that as a whatever to take me out. I sought for a man to stand in the gap. There are many businessmen, there are very few intercessors. 
And so, this is what I'm trying to say to you. What I am doing here is a sacrifice. The president I'm talking about, listen to this, who, the, the Marabas, I lived in his house for one year. When, I mean, so, when he was president, I could have gone there to say, sir, I'm here. <laughs> and I want to be living in your house for the next one year. <laughs> yes, and he would have, because he was my dad's friend. Does this make sense? But I did not visit him once. Why? Because I am at an altar making another sacrifice. Listen to this. If you are going to, and that is why God will show up because I've given up something. The Bible says he gave him, they gave themselves continually. Somebody say continually. <laughs> and then he got other people to look after the business side. The problem is that there are not a lot, enough discerning people to say, pastors, you sort this out. You don't have to worry about this. And I'm not talking about, uh, 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 you know, for ourselves. And there are too many people just, and there are many intercessors who are tired. Now they are just facing business. David had Levitical priesthood who were paid to stand in shifts. Asaph, Jedutum, Heman, because he knew that, look, hey, if we're going to win this battle, listen to this, there were 66 battles, international battles that um, David fought. He won all of them. There were 21 assassination attempts against David. None of them succeeded. Why? Because he had strong altars. Number two. <laughs> I think uh, I only have time for this for this now, continuity, Consist consistency. Listen to this. You can also offer, I said this for, about marriage. When I got married to my wife, eh, at the altar I gave my life to my wife. How she gave her life to me. It's a big, it's a big cost or price. Maybe, I mean, she, a bigger price in the sense that she changed her name. It's a big one. And then she changed her address. You join me. So you think that's it. But listen to this. Priesthood re re requires more than that continuity. Where you make sacrifices every day. Every day. Every day. God, God told Aaron, he said, not only will you serve as priests, but you will do this continually. It shall be a perpetual offering. Listen to this. The same with you, yourself and I. When the, when the, when the church... In, in the book of Acts, when they relaxed, listen, they, they killed James. When they, then they, they, they arrested Peter as well, and they were getting ready to kill him. Why? Because the other guys were giving continuous sacrifices. And then it was only when the church, the Bible says in verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison. Many of you are, are kept in prison. The reason why you are saying it is because constant prayer is not being made. Everyone say constant prayer. Constant prayer was offered to God for them by the church. Some people have died because of the lack of constant prayer. The prayer was started, but it was not continued. And this is why we have a, a prayer chain that is uh, it's 60 days. But let me tell you this. After the 60 days, I'm starting another one. Yeah. I'm sorry. Why? Because of the things. We, you, and then number is it? Uh, um, the, the, the third thing is C. So is is somebody say consecration? Somebody say consecration. Okay. So what was the first thing? The cost. Second thing what? Consistency. The, the third thing is consecration. Now what is consecration? Consecration is <laughs> priests. No, do not just give sacrifice and they do not just give it continually. There is something that is required of their life. You have to be a certain kind of priest. In Ezekiel 8, 11, 14, he says, And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. Somebody says 70 men. If you have 70 men praying for you, won't you be happy? If you have 70 men praying for your family, won't you be happy? 70 men of the house, and in their midst stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphat. Especially if you have one of them by the name of Jazaniah. Wouldn't you know that this guy is really... 
just said, nah. And then, and then this, is, this is what he says. Each man had a censer in his hand. Each man was interceding. And the thick cloud of incense went up. He said, man, see, you know, stuff is going up to heaven. Then he said, he said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols with pornography. For they say the Lord does not see it. Every man flirting, every woman. He said, so there are many 70 priests. And you, there was one time I faced a lot of attack. My family, and I couldn't understand. And we had intercessors. The Lord said, these ones are not intercessors. These are gangsters. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, you know what they spent half of the, in fact, three quarters of intercessory time talking about abusing the pastor. Yes, I'm not joking. As a, this pastor is not doing what, what he should be doing, blah, blah. How do you know? Were you there when God gave him the call? The attacks I faced, you will not man on every front. So you can have people praying, but they're actually praying on you. P-R-E-Y. And so what is consecrate? Listen to this. The, the people, these people are not, the, the, the word is, look, they are compromised priests. That there are many people, and what is consecrate? Cons consecrate means to make or declare sacred, set apart or dedicate to the service of a deity alone. That's why God told me, he says, Shala, walk before me and be thou blameless. Why? Because I'm looking for a man, I'm looking for men who will stand, and when they stand, that they will have voice with me. It is very clear from the meaning of the word consecrate what God requires from his human attendance to, the, to his altar. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. We, why did God allow the ark of God to be captured? by the Philistines. I believe it is because the glory of God does not travel on the shoulders of filthy and unrighteous servants of God. It is difficult to overthrow an evil altar with which you have something in common with. Tell your neighbor, say, I think he's talking about you there. Sin empowers evil altars. Sin is a sacrifice to the devil, but obedience is a sacrifice to God. Anytime we obey God, we are sacrificing to God. Anytime we sin, we are sacrificing to the devil. And this is why under Eli's reign, because the, the sons of Eli were sleeping with the girls at the end, they were eating the whatever, they, they, they thought they were protected because they had the, the altar of God, but you know, you can have the box, but the boss may not be there. The Bible called it Ichabod, the glory has departed. So they went to war with an empty box. The fact that the vicar is still wearing the collar doesn't mean God is with, is with him. The last point is, can I, can I just finish this please? Is covenant. Covenant, and I use a more powerful agreement. So we sometimes the word, but or communion. Listen to this. This is the most important one, and the reason why I'm covering. I actually asked um, uh, James to co cover the unless you know, you, you, you know. But I, I thought it was important to just quickly mention this. You know, you can cover the cost as in pay sacrifice. What's the second thing? You can also be consistent. And then you can actually consecrate yourself. I don't do this. I don't talk this. I don't, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. I keep, but then the, most, the last one is perhaps maybe one of the most difficult ones is to work in agreement with others. Especially people who are not lovely. But you see, we are come, and this is this is why this is really Satan. Satan. Satan is a master at this. Okay, keep being holy to yourself, keep being whatever. But you know what? 
I'm going to cause, let that person create an offense, and you will, you will not forgive them. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll show you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to end with this. Let me show you this. The Bible says, how did power come in the book of Acts? This is what happened. It says in Acts 2.1, these all continued with one accord. Somebody one accord. One accord is not a car. <laughs> 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 they continue one accord in prayer and supplication. We told, then in Acts 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost had what fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Let me tell you, it's easy to be in one place. It's not it's easy to be in one accord. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can I have the help, um, um, uh, Pastor James and Pastor Beams? This is, can we agree on something? Please put your Bible and things down. Can we agree that there will be revival? Pastor Beams, hold his hand. It's okay. <laughs> you, have my, you, have my, you have my permission for, for, for two minutes. <laughs> yeah. So we are agreeing that God will move mightily in this place. Yeah? In the United Kingdom, we are agreeing. But the problem is that holding hands is not one accord. We're in one place, but holding hands is not one accord. Holding hands, uh, here I am, envious of, of him. <laughs> yeah, his hairstyle, his, 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 his <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that he has four children, and, you know, and that, you know, <laughs> he, he gets invited to more conferences than I, you know, and I'm like, Lord, <laughs> slow his ministry down. <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you get what I'm saying? And, and here is somebody else, and he said something that offended her, you know, blah, 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 and, you know, and all of that stuff. Listen to this. And we're busy saying, we agree. The devil knows you are not in agreement. Now, let, and let me show you so that, and then I'll just get out of your way. Let me just, let me just show you. Look, this is what it says, and this is how you will know it. Hmm? The Bible says this. Huh? I'm going to read one scripture first, and then I'm going to read the latter one first. This is what it says. What we just did here, what we're trying to do here is in Matthew 18, 18 to 20. As shortly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be what? Bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be what? Loosed. If you, if you bind demons, they'll be bound. If you loose angels, they'll be loosed. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree isn't it, on earth concerning Anything, somebody say anything that they ask, it will be what? Done for your father in heaven. And Satan knows that. But let me tell you, it's saying this is, this is the legislative power of the church. That if the church can truly agree. But before this thing happens, the Lord now tells us what to do before you start praying this kind of prayer. Matthew 18, 15, 17. Just some verses further. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Don't call three other people. If he hears you, then he goes out. If he refuses to hear, blah, blah, blah. Listen to this. And he's saying that if you don't do this, in fact, he says, if your brother sins against you, or you know you've offended your brother, drop your sacrifice. Why? Because your sacrifice is now worthless, has no value until you restore with your brother. Let me tell you, I end with this. The, 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 the biggest thing that the devil has done to the church, the worst thing is that, okay, I, I don't get to see Pastor James all the time. At least far in Manchester. But the Bible says one will put a thousand to flight but, and two, ten thousand. This, so God allows us to get married and we think it's for sexual intimacy. That's we think. That's one of it. But it's really to take territory. And so that, you know, and God says, well, one will put a thousand, two, ten thousand. So we're going to push back all these things in our generational line. But then it says in First Peter chapter 3 that if I dishonor my wife, if I don't understand that, if I try, it says that your prayer will be hindered. How many spouses have offense? 
or result. I'm not talking about, there are many, there are many, look, no, it's not that they're not talking, they're talking, but there are many unresolved, unforgived issues that you've swept under the carpet and you've never really dealt with. And you're just surviving. Let's stand up and pray. How powerful is your altar? How powerful is your altar? I know, I mean, we will rectify the time and all of that. So you, you still have, yeah, yeah. You know, how powerful is your altar? I want you to begin to pray in terms of, are you paying the price? Or, or is, there, is there another altar that is paying a greater price than you are paying? And you want things to shift. And you want to, you want to break generational patterns. How powerful is that altar? Are you in the place of constant and consistent prayer? How powerful is your altar? Are you in that place of, of consecration where you are not compromised? Then how powerful is your altar? Are you in covenant agreement? Is there somebody in the church that has offended you? Look, that is the one in, the, in recent times. I've just, even things that I thought, oh, I let that pass. I let that pass. I said, no, I'm not going to let this hinder my prayer. Let me call. There's something that it doesn't really matter. But I'm saying, look, look. Let's be honest. You need, to, you need, the Bible says, put that thing, your sacrifice down, and go and tell that person that they hurt you. Or you hurt them. Or, you know what, or just get over it. Yeah, because if that was, some of us, it's like, you will tell everybody, every, you'll be having meetings with all, everybody in church. That should also show you your level of maturity. That you, you seem to be very prickly. So could it be you? In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Lord, help us. Help us. Help us become a more effective church. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be seated in his presence. Quickly. Please welcome Pastor Beams. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many of us are blessed already? Challenged already? Uh, I know that, you know, this is, and this is only the first half. Uh, so I want to encourage you to, you know, widen your spirit, uh, maintain um, your expectation, because I believe that, you know, God is going to continue to do something phenomenal um, here tonight. I'm here just really to welcome some really, really special people. I see lots of new faces, lots of first timers. We just want to welcome you, make you feel at home. If you're a first timer, would you wave at me wherever you are? Come on, lift those hands up high. God bless you. Third team, do we have, are we ushering them into, um, um, if you look behind me, right behind me, we have a little vestibule. We want to keep you just for a couple of minutes. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be back in time um, to hear uh, Pastor James. Would just love to give you a little bit of information about the church. Um, so please do rise up now with your gift bags. Uh, sorry, with your bags, whatever it is that you brought, uh, and make your way to the vestibule. Please, let's put our hands together as they do that. God bless you as you do so. Let's keep clapping for them. Let's keep clapping for them. Hallelujah. Amen. Please let's welcome Pastor back. Hallelujah. Okay, so, so that the new guests don't feel left out. Yeah, can we just stand up and just pray for two minutes? Is that, yeah, I don't know about you, but... <laughs> There's serious stuff happening. Uh, so we're, I, I, two prayers that we're going to pray. The first prayer is, how many of you know, I, I said God has called me to raise prophetic intercessors. So the first dimension of our prayer point is that God make me prophetic, which means God open my eyes to the spirit realm. Open my eyes to the spirit realm so I can know what the target is. Open my spirit, open my... By the grace of God, this is a prophetic church. This is a church that has a mantle. And so you may be a visitor and you're saying, Lord, help me tap into the Wi-Fi here and so that I can go home with a prophetic impartation. 
open my eyes to see what, what, where the real problem is. Matokara, me tuskele brato so palakali, rosso toki paranta, zetikete, mantoro barasi tikede, jude ke paranto sukede, manto sikede bala. Can we make sure the new guests are back here so that they don't miss out on, on, on Pastor James' session? Rosso pakatesi, ze itekale, rantakade site. Open my eyes to what is really happening in my family. Open my eyes to the behind the scene on, in the unseen realm. Manto seke paranteres, vie frato koporoba litres. Open my eyes, O oh Lord. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Lord, enrich my dream life. Give me the, the grace of discerning of spirits. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Open my eyes to see Manto Kodobada. The same way Elisha's um, 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 open, asked God to open the eyes of his servant to, to, to see, to show that those who are with us are more than those who are against us. Open our eyes to see where the real challenge, where the roots of the problem is. The second prayer I want us to pray is, Lord, give me the grace to stand as an intercessor. That, that which you've shown me, give me the grace, the fortitude. Give me the grace to pay the price, the cost, what is required. Give me the grace of consistency, not to leave my post until the thing is re resolved. Give me the grace to be consecrated, to be truly dedicated, not to defy myself, not to compromise the call. Man terakatasi, rabato soporubada. Father Lord, give me also the grace, O oh God, to walk in covenant, not to speak against my brother, not to hold anybody in offense, not to rebel, not to be disloyal, but to walk in covenant agreement so that I can see the result of my prayer. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me, we may be seated. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you excited? So that's part one. And we, we're getting rearing up for part two. And, you know, without taking too much of our time, very interesting. I don't know how long I've... I think we... I think you, you, you made contact with me. Where was it? In 2020, after the, you apparently came for... The, the first Supernatural Shift conference we, you know, um, we had. I'd heard about prayer storm, but I didn't know who it was. I just knew there was something storming around, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that there was some, you know, prayer, you know. So when you, when I saw this guy on, on, on um, is he Instagram now? And then he just reached out and said, oh, you know, really enjoyed the conference, blah, blah, blah. Apparently, he came for another speaker, but then became even connected with the, another speaker. He, he discovered that person, you know, um, Apostle Arome. And the, I think what caught his attention was when Arome said, anybody that doesn't, doesn't pray for eight hours is joking or something, you know. Anyway, the long story short is that since then, he's, when Apostle Arome comes into town, comes with him, and I've always kind of like, oh, wow, great guy, doing great things and stuff. And I, I've always had it behind my mind that sometime I would call him and invite him for something, but I didn't know what, what, what yet? And then one morning, this was, was it in January, yes. No, it was in December, actually. I was on my way to Nigeria. That morning, I woke up, and the Lord said to call him and invite him. I was going to invite him for a prayer summit. And that was how, and there was something else that caught my attention earlier. God told me to invite somebody else. I didn't know they were connected. It was in my conversation with him you know, or just before then that I found out there was a connection. I was like, ah, okay. And then he set me on a journey. And that, that was how, you know, I, start, I listened, began to listen to one or two of his messages. And I was like, is this the same guy? Wow. <laughs> and I saw that, wow, well, God had really taken this guy to another level in terms of, and when I say another level, sometimes, you know, we get into this celebrity thing, you know, with preachers. No, it's not about who is the latest thing and the reigning thing. And if you remember, when I called you after, I said, look, you need to be careful that you don't get into that bandwagon where people are just inviting you because you are now the, the, the new thing, the flavor of the month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I said, you have a clear message at this time, and you need to guard and protect that message. 
And this is the reason why we're having this conference today. They just, they just concluded the conference in Manchester. Over 1,200 people from over 30 nations. Many people from Australia, from the US, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, but I believe very strongly that there is a simple guy. I love, I mean, that's one of the things I love about Simple guy, but he has a clear message God has put in his heart and in his mouth. And he's doing all of this, being married to one lovely wife. Is she Rebecca by any chance? Is that her name? Re Rebecca's are lovely. Yeah, my wife is also Rebecca. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. And so, what was I saying, sorry? <laughs> Married to one wife and he has four children. And I don't know how he does it. Because I only have two and I don't get enough sleep. So, <laughs> without, without taking any more time, put your hands together as we give... James Aladero, a TLC welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Dr. Shola. And your lovely wife is nice to meet you. Um, I often come to London for different reasons to minister, but, uh, and I've been to one of your meetings, maybe two of your meetings. Uh, so I want to thank you publicly for introducing me to Apostle Romeo Sai. <laughs> because if you didn't invite me, if you didn't invite him, I wouldn't have known who he was. And I still remember, it was just before lockdown, you posted a clip of him saying, if, you've, if you're 21 and you've not prayed in tongues for seven hours, your life is a joke. <laughs> First, I was amazed that someone had the boldness and guts to say that. <laughs> Then secondly, I thought, well, if that's his challenge to the people, well, how much prayer is he doing personally? So I was very intrigued. And because I'm all about prayer, I was very intrigued by his ministry. And so I started following and got really impacted. I posted the video on my Instagram stories. And one of my friends got in touch and said, uh, a, few people are, a, few, a few people are offended. <laughs> and uh, so I was talking to my wife about it. And she's like, well, you know. He's, uh, he's speaking to people that are in a, in a context. You know, if you're in the barracks and uh, whoever the leader is comes in and looks at the soldiers and says, if you're in this place and you can't give me 50 push-ups, your life is a joke. Does, does that make sense in that context? So when you're raising warriors, you speak to them in a certain way. <laughs> and you don't go to the barracks looking for love, right? <laughs> So uh, I want to thank you for introducing me to him. He's been a great blessing in my life, uh, and ha as he has been to many of you. Um, I believe we're in a critical time in the body of Christ. The Lord is wanting to raise up an army. In fact, he is raising up an army. But the problem is, we cannot be an army if you're not a soldier. And with the way the church has been going for so long, you notice that a lot of the ministers that are carrying the word of the now, of the Lord, they're very much about raising up believers to understand who they are and their capacity being enlarged in the spirit. Uh, and the, the, that's good, but that's also fighting with an old mindset, which is always coming to the man of power for the hour to receive the blessing. And it's not that God doesn't raise men and women up, but we're in the day of the saints, where God is wanting you to arise in your own authority. Rise and lay hands on yourself. Rise and lay hands on your children. Rise and begin to speak the word and know that you are anointed as a believer. And so oftentimes when we put on events and conferences, um, you know, lots of people want to talk and, you know, ask lots of questions and lots of counseling and all these, even though I don't see myself as a, uh, you know, counselor in that way, I, I get to talk to lots of people asking lots of things. And oftentimes I think to myself, if our discipleship was stronger, we wouldn't be having to have some of these conversations. 
if we were teaching people how to be real soldiers, we wouldn't be having some of these conversations. And so I'm, I'm realizing that the 21st century church has become a nursery. The 21st century church has become a nursery where babies are being fed and not a barracks where warriors are being bred. Babies want bottle, not battle. They want to be made to feel good. Pastor, lay hands on me, lay legs on me, make me happy. <laughs> but God is wanting to raise up an army. And so if he's going to raise up an army, he's going to train that army. He's going to train those soldiers. And so many of you are going through battles, but you have no idea that the personal battles you're dealing with, they're preparation for kingdom battles. So he's training you. You're dealing with family issues. He's training you. God's greatest intercessors are often forged in the crucible of afflictions and tribulations. You're wanting to get out quickly, whereas he's wanting to make a warrior. It takes time for God to make someone. It doesn't just happen overnight. So stop trying to look for the shortcut. I know you want the man of God to lay hands on you and everything shift. Many of you have been to many meetings and hands have been laid on you and things haven't shifted. It's because God wants you to be the one shifting it. So he, the anointed man comes and does his thing and things happen and people get set free. But your own hasn't changed and you've been to meeting after meeting after, is because God is wanting you to navigate the realm. He's wanting to find the pathway in the spirit and get to that place where your breakthrough is, but not just for you. Now you've been there, you can also be used of God to raise other people and you become an asset. Many Christians are liabilities in the kingdom. You're just coming to get God bless me, make me happy, give me a nice house, a nice car, nice family, and that's it. As far as God's agenda is concerned, there's nothing you're contributing to his agenda. You're just coming to suck and take and take and take. But when God needs people, you're nowhere to be found. God is wanting to raise up an army. Everyone say an army. army. You can't have an army when you don't have soldiers. You need soldiers that know how to use their weapons. You can't be a soldier if you're not familiar with your weapon. We say, let's pray, and you're praying wimpish. You're, you're, you're praying uh, lazy. I pray with my son very often. In fact, this morning, prayed on the way to school. And there's sometimes when I'm praying, he gets distracted. Just this, your, your tongues are lazy. You're praying lazy tongues. We're at war. Wake up. Yes, daddy. Yes, daddy. I have no choice but to train my children to fight. Because we are at war. Why would I put them in front of video games and TV all day? When I'm traveling the nations dealing with demons. And those demons track my house. When they get there, they better find my children praying in the spirit. So I understand God is wanting to raise up an army. But there's sometimes when I go to different places and mix with different believers, it's clear that we have not adopted that war mentality, that, 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 that mindset. And when I say war, it's not just even just the war for your own breakthrough and God moving in your own life. They're kingdom battles. They're things God wants to achieve in this region. They're things God wants to achieve in London. They're things God wants to achieve in the United Kingdom. And when his eyes look across the nation, would he want to recruit you to be part of his force to advance his agenda? Or does he look and you go, okay, well, this one is only concerned about themselves. And by the way, the fact that you're only thinking about yourself is a sign of your spiritual maturity. Because now I have a nine-week-old baby and it doesn't matter when I get home at 2 a.m. from traveling or 3 a.m. or 12 midnight, that baby is gonna cry if the baby is not happy and needs milk or is uncomfortable or the nappy is full. The baby does not care about my feelings or my wife's feelings that we've not had sleep, we just had a conference, we've been out all day. The baby doesn't care. All the baby's thinking about is their comfort and what they want in that moment. But that's okay. That's okay because that's where the baby is at. But that becomes a problem when that baby has grown and is now six years old. 
and 10 years old and he's still acting like a baby. And all my 10 year old now washes dishes, now hoovers, now takes her, because a sign of maturity is responsibility. You start to think beyond yourself. Now I have to sit him down and say, no, you don't interrupt adults when we're talking, shush. I never did that to my parents. Wait, these children nowadays. <laughs> Can anyone relate? <laughs> Your mouth is too big, shush. That mouth will get in trouble, just. <laughs> so, um, so now he's learning, oh, daddy, I didn't realize. Well, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to do that, okay. So now he's becoming more socially aware beyond himself. He's having, res that's a sign of maturity. But the nine week old cannot think that way, doesn't have the capacity yet. So what happens when you start to grow is it begins to show in your behavior, in your prayer life, the content of your prayer life gives us an indication of your level of spiritual maturity. What are the things that you're praying about? And there are many Christians, their whole prayer life is on the same note. They have not shifted in their conversation. They're still having baby talk in their spiritual conversation, so to speak, when they've been Christians for 10 years. But God is wanting to raise up an army, so he's wanting to, sometimes he's wanting to fast track and get you growing quickly, so he sends you some tribulations. And you, you prayed the same prayer when you were two months old as a Christian and God answered it. Now you're six, seven years, you pray the same prayer and God is nowhere to be found. I, anyone knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> you're, you're praying the same thing, but you're not seeing the same result. You used to see it because when you're a baby, he was quick to answer. Now your maturing is wanting you to grow some muscle and start to learn how to fight. And so God is wanting to raise up an effective army that will not back out. Before I go into the scriptures, some Christians go to church and they say things like, you know what, Pastor, you know, I've been coming here for so many, uh, whatever it is, you know, now I, I think I need to leave this church now because I'm not being fed. Anyone heard that before? Let this be the last time you ever hear that or say that. Because what do you mean you're not being fed? I've got a four-year-old and she can feed herself. What do you mean you're not being fed? Have you lost your Bible? What do you mean you're not being fed? Have you lost your worship life? What do you mean you're not being fed? Have you lost your prayer life? You don't come to church to get a word from God just that. That's not all you come to church to do. In fact, I want to say you don't just come to church to get a word from God. You come to church to get confirmation of the word you were getting when you're at home. You're putting all the responsibility on the pastor to do everything. Maybe that's why some, some pastors are burnt out because you're trying to live through them and you need to arise and live your own life in God. Get in the word by yourself. Fast by, your, pray and seek God by yourself. And as you begin to grow, then God starts to open up your spiritual giftings. You start to become a, 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 an, an asset to the kingdom of God. I repeat, God is wanting to raise up an army. In this journey of God raising up an army, it will not be able to do that without the church. We are the people he wants to use. And so we need to have a revelation of the church. So I actually want to pick up from where Dr. Shola left, talking about the corporate unity of the church. God will not be able to achieve his purposes on the earth without the people of God, without us, the body of Christ. The first time the word church is used in scripture, Matthew, Jesus says, I will build my church. The, the Greek word there is ecclesia. I will build my ecclesia. And then when we investigate what the ecclesia is, imagine Rome uh, or the Romans conquer Manchester. They've conquered Manchester in the war, but Manchester is a completely different place to Rome. So what they do is they gather a group of people called the ecclesia together and they send that group of people to Manchester and their job is to infiltrate the society to make Manchester look like Rome. Now, do you understand what the Ecclesia does? So when Jesus said, I'll build my Ecclesia, notice he didn't even say, I'll build my synagogue. That word Ecclesia is a secular word. In, to the people he was speaking to, 
it was not the, the most common, the most uh, uh, similar word that makes us think of church like we think of when we hear the word church was not the word Jesus used to disciples because he could have used, I'll build my synagogue or I'll build my congregation. He said, I'll build my ecclesia. So these are groups of people that he wants to raise up and send into territories to colonize that territory spiritually. Because we will not take charge of the territory physically if we don't first influence it and take charge of it spiritually. That's why Abraham is our pattern. Because for Abraham, he was called a prophet while he never prophesied. Because his life was the prophecy. And you study his life and the way God led him. He took over the territory years, hundreds of years before his descendants physically possessed it. You know how we took hold of it? The altars. And each altar he built had a texture to it. It had something to it. And there's a lot of revelation in each of those altars. But that's not where we're going today. The point I'm trying to make is God is wanting to raise his ecclesia, his church, that understand who they are and understand how to wield his authority through them. One of the things we don't understand is the power of our, um, I, I said, well, let's go to the corporate anointing. There's some things that God will not be able to do in a territory without the corporate body coming together. I don't care how anointed a man or woman of God is, no one person can take on a whole army. And so God does something through his body. We are the body of Christ. Mind you, we're not the body of Jesus. We are the body of what? So Christ speaks of the fullness of the anointing. The anointed one. So there's something that we can access together that we cannot access individually. And so when we start to understand that God is wanting to raise up an army and we begin to grow in our, in our individual kind of walk with the Lord, in our, in our, in our calling, um, our growth inadvertently impacts the corporate anointing as well. Because when we all come together, you bring your supply. You bring your supply. I bring my supply, and then we have an explosion. But sometimes the problem is we're looking for everything to happen on the platform. So, the, the man of God may come on fire, but you have come distracted. You've gone with all these other things. You've come with, you know, you've been, you've been on Facebook for, on, and Instagram and Disney Plus for six hours and watched movies and movies and movies, and the other person over there has come with their own thing. And so everyone has come, but there is like a wet blanket in the spirit. So if you've come with no fire, no fire, no fire, no fire, and we want to ascend in the spirit, how many of this is going to be a lot of work? It's a lot easier when each person comes with their own fire and their own hunger. So the Lord is wanting to build an ecclesia made up of people who understand their identity in him. So now I want to go to Acts 2. Acts 2 is a scripture that Dr. Shola kind of made reference to. And by the way, he said so much. <laughs> uh, all the different things he said, you know, they're all different sermons in, this, in themselves, the different points. Just so much was said in that short time. Um, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were all with one accord in one place. So let's say this way. They were all in one place. But they weren't just in one place. They were what? In one accord. Now, they had been together for several uh, days. They had been praying. In fact, Jesus said to them, wait for the release of the Holy Spirit. They understood that to mean pray. He said, wait, but they interpreted that as prayer. So for several days, they were seeking the Lord. And I want to remind you that their prayer meeting had a start time and no end time. Just let that sink in. You see, we want God to move, but I don't think we've stepped into the mindset that led to Pentecost. Their prayer meeting had a start time, and the end time was whenever he came. So they would have been praying together for 50 days if, this, if that was how long it took. 
It, uh, it's a military mindset. It's, it's, it's a staying in power. The ability to stay. How long can you pray without God showing up? Or are you so in a hurry that if you've prayed for two hours and it doesn't come, you give up? See, I know we preachers like to share stories of how God showed up for us. But sometimes I don't want to share some of my stories because it might discourage many people. You mean you pray for that long and nothing happened? <laughs> you mean you spend those days and... See, nothing, nothing happened in the natural that seemed spectacular to me. But I knew there were reconfigurations going on in the spirit. Even there, I didn't always feel it. So we need to understand the mindset of the warrior. The warrior goes into battle not thinking, you know what? If this gets difficult, I'm going to run back home. Warriors don't think that way. They go and they're ready to win the battle or die trying. They, like, there is no retreat. That's one of our sayings, a prayer song. No retreat and no surrender. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws at us. We're committed to this long term and we're going to keep going until. Everyone say until. They were going to pray until, until, until. Their end time was until. Same thing with Elijah. The Lord spoke to Elijah and the Lord said to Elijah, I'm going to send the rain. You know what Elijah did not do? Elijah did not write a book about it. Elijah did not do, you know, a, a public, you know, you know, maybe put something in the newspapers and get the word out. The Lord is going to send rain. He didn't release a word for the year. The rain is coming. Everyone lift your hands. The rain is coming. Amen. Elijah did not do that. He didn't just, he didn't release a declaration. In fact, let me just put that thought on pause. You know what happened in 1 Kings 17 where Elijah stood before Ahab and said, before the Lord of Israel whom I stand, there shall be no rain. We think Elijah just said a declaration because 1 Kings 17 doesn't tell us the backstory to that. But James 5 tells us the backstory to that declaration. You know what James 5 says? Elijah was a man just like us and he prayed. 1 Kings 17 does not tell us he prayed. He just said he stood and spoke. So we want to copy the standing and speaking, but we don't want to do the, the homework. Are you with me? Elijah went on that mountaintop, and the Lord had said to him, I'm going to send the rain. He didn't just go on the mountaintop and just release a faith declaration. Thank you, Lord, that the rain is coming. Amen. He put his head between his knees. Do you know what that posture is? It's a birthing posture. So... If that's a birthing posture, that means Elijah conceived in the spirit. When you conceive, as I have found out from having four children, your appetite changes. Your appetite is now dependent on what you're carrying. What you're carrying on the inside starts to affect what you feed on. You cannot just listen to any preacher. You cannot just listen to any woman, man of, are you hearing me? If you've really conceived, there are certain type of messages that will... F <laughs> oh, this is the reigning preacher right now. You, you, it's not resonating. Because it's not, it's not ministering to what you're carrying on the inside. Are you hearing me? So Elijah conceived in the spirit and he had to faithfully carry that seed full term. Which means it's possible to conceive and have spiritual abortions. Where you receive from heaven, but somehow you lose it. And you don't get to full term. Many Christians are quick to receive, but they're not faithful to carry all the way to full term. Elijah took that word to full term, and then he came to the birthing moment. See, Elijah received the prophetic word, and then he stepped on the mountaintop, and now began to push. Once, twice, and he kept going. We know he did it seven times, but imagine on the sixth time, nothing has happened. So now on the sixth time, you have a theological problem, and it's this, Lord, you said, and here I am, pushing in prayer, not casual praying, because many of us pray casual prayers. Can I announce to you, a casual approach to prayer produces casualties. <laughs> Elijah was not praying casual prayers. He was groaning and birthing in the spirit. 
You tell me you're intense in prayer and I can't see it on your face. You need to update your face. Because in the prayer meeting, you look bored. In fact, have you not noticed? Sometimes you talk with your friends about football, about movies. Everyone is laughing. The moment someone says, let's pray, someone always yawns. Why is it that your body is programmed, your flesh, to react to the things that are most beneficial to your spiritual development? Your flesh fights the most. Elijah was not casual praying. And by the way, can I, this is no Nigerian thing. This is not, oh, South Korean prayer. It's not, this is a kingdom thing. Praying intensely. Elijah put his soul in his prayer. You tell me you're on fire for God, but I come near you and can't feel the heat. You don't have fire. You've just got smoke. You can't, you don't have to advertise fire. Fire speaks for itself. What kind of prayer do you think you're praying? And you're just yawning and acting all bored and disconnected. You've not stepped into the mode of the spirit yet. You're still in the outer core. You're still distracted by Facebook. You still want to get on your phone. You're still far, far, far away. You need to navigate to the inner court. And it will take you time. It will take all this kind of, oh, you know, they said we should pray, so we're just going to... The demons are joining you. The demons are comfortable because, see, if the prayer is not moving you, why should heaven be bothered? If you are not in it, if you are not in it, why should heaven listen? You're taking prayer casually. Elijah was groaning. Even Hannah, when she was praying, even though she wasn't loud, it could be told by looking at Hannah, you could tell this one is intense. And you tell me, you know, oh, we're, 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 in the, we're in Britain, we're in the UK, you know, people are chilled here. I can show you many Caucasians that pray in tents. And I've convinced them and I've taught them it's not a black thing. Find your intense mode. Because this moment, it's not a casual mode. So Elijah was going to stay in that mode until he gave birth. Now, his physical posture, putting his head between his knees, was aligning with the agony in his soul, was aligning with the posture of the spirit. So Elijah stepped into oneness within himself. Many of you are praying, but you're not there. Your body is there, your mind is in the fridge, your emotions are still fighting with the last conversation, the, the person you had a conversation with, you're upset with. So you're scattered. You're there, but you're... So you have not stepped into unity in yourself. So the first level of effective praying, before we step into the corporate dimension, is one, you need to get into oneness. It takes time to get there. Especially when you understand the distractions that have been thrown at you. It's a good thing when you understand your journey in the Spirit. Enough to know that you haven't started praying, even though you've been praying for an hour. You know... The main part of praying is getting to the place where the prayer happens. To get to that place is a pilgrimage of getting rid of the distractions so that your body, your soul, your spirit can fuse together. You see, when you step into that place, you're unstoppable in the spirit. And sometimes when you step into that realm, you're so less flesh conscious. Your physical body starts to vibrate, not because you're trying to do some motion, but it's like, that's the only ventilation you have to align with what you're feeling on the inside. Anyone knows what I'm talking about here? That is the mode where things really shift. Not just casual praying again alone. Elijah knew how to get to that place. And this is the interesting thing. Elijah, by the sixth time, did not know necessarily if it was going to break through on the seventh time. So he would have carried on doing that. For 50, 60 times. His mindset was, we're going to do this. What's the word? What's the word? He had that warrior mindset. We are going to lock into this posture in prayer until the 21st century church does not have that mindset. We want a quick fix. And as Dr. Shola was saying earlier, we just want to, oh Lord, we just curse that altar in Jesus' name, amen, and move on the rest of our lives. Whereas the sacrifice that raised that altar 
and the commitment of the priest, the priest who raised that altar is more committed to the devil than you are to God. You cannot overthrow that altar because their sacrifice is weightier. I don't know how many of you remember the story in 2 Kings 3. Elisha releases a prophecy that the nation of Israel and Judah, I think they were going to battle. And he says, they were going to win the battle. Elijah, the double portion prophet, said they were going to win. So, I mean, we believe the prophet, right? Well, they believe the prophet until they go on the battlefield. The enemy is losing. And the enemy takes out his firstborn son. Who was in line to the throne? Anyone knows the story? He sacrifices his firstborn son. And he says, there was great indignation against Israel. Against Israel. So the battle shifted, even though they had the prophecy. You know why? The enemy out-sacrificed the people of God. Now, the lesson is not that we start sacrificing our children, obviously. However, notice what happened at the cross. Notice what happened when Father God allowed his own son, are you hearing me? Sacrifice releases power in the spirit realm. In the kingdom of darkness, they understand that sacrifice releases power. Even God himself knows sacrifice releases power. That's why the blood of Jesus is so powerful. Because when that blood hit the earth, the earth, the earth had never experienced that kind of blood before. Because it's God's blood. Everything in the earth, that's why there was an earthquake. The earth was shaking like, where is this blood come from? We don't have any way of computing this type of blood. That blood is still powerful today. And that's come from sacrifice. So there is a law in the spirit that sacrifice releases spiritual power. So Elijah stepped into that place of personal sacrifice. He was ready to pray and seek the Lord until the breakthrough came. Now, there's a certain type of breakthrough you can step into as an individual. But I believe God is wanting us to step into a corporate level of breakthrough that goes beyond just our individual breakthroughs and now starts to affect territories. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. They were all together. They were physically in the place, so they were not online. Bless you, our online audience. I know there can be uh, blessings released because people watch from all over, but there's something quite special about being physically in one place. Then they were in one accord. Everyone say accord. So this is where it gets interesting. So I'm going to use my keyboard player as an example because I do play the keyboard. Can you play me the chord C? Just simple C, like, okay, can you play that loud so everyone can hear it? So that's the C chord. You don't have to be a musician to understand what I'm about to say. In the C chord, you have the C note. Play the C note, just one. You have the E note, and then you have the G note. And play them together. So together, they sound nice, but individually, they're okay. Are you with me? Each note on that keyboard has a unique frequency. Each note on that keyboard has a unique frequency. So now, to produce a chord, a chord is the combination of more than just one note. So two, three, four notes. Are you with me? So when he plays that one note, you're just experiencing one person's anointing. Play the chord. So now you experience a combination of several notes together. Now, play the C chord, but maybe with the bass and just a bit nicer. Okay. That is the same chord, but he's added other combinations to it. They are all wanting to achieve one purpose, which is harmony. Are you hearing me? Because they want to get to harmony, they have to, each note has to be rightly aligned next to the other one. So the C note is not intimidated by the G note. The C note is not crying out, Lord, why didn't you make me sound like the G? 
The ear notes, the Lord, the, 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 you know, he's not crying out to God saying, Lord, I, why is my frequency different to theirs? Why do they have long hair and I only have short hair? Why do they sound so good when they pray and I can't even string a nice sentence together? Are, are you hearing me? Yes, so when he plays that chord, what you receive and what you hear is harmony. Harmony is a picture of unity. Because each note is secure in its identity. It's not, unity is not uniformity. We're not all the same. In unity, there's a revelation of identity. Because each individual has security in who they are in God. So because I know God on my own and I'm a soldier and I can pray without you being there, I, I have a walk with God. He's dealt with me. He's dealing with me. And I'm, you know, I have this thing going on. When I come with you, I am not intimidated that you manifest something different to me. In the early days, I used to get invited to preach in places and sometimes African meetings. They'll have four preachers. Five preachers. I'm like, why do they have five preachers at this meeting? And maybe they put me as number four. By the time the first two people have preached, I'm like, Lord, I have nothing else to say. I, they should not have ever invited me here. <laughs> you know why? Because by them manifesting their anointing, I was intimidated. And sh them manifesting their anointing shot me down. Because I had not discovered who I really was in God. So them displaying them made me feel like I was nothing in God. But when you truly start to discover God for yourself, um, listen, you're going to be so happy to be you. Yes. It doesn't matter how amazing a preacher is, how amazing the singer is, how amazing the keyboard player is. Like, when you, when you step into who God's made you, you're so happy. I don't want to be anyone else. And at times, I listen back to my own preach and I jump up and I'm like, oh my goodness. My, my wife would tell you, I'll get, I'm like, my God. <laughs> not, not because I think I'm a great preacher, but because even I am amazed. Because my security is not in me. I have found God. Now he's manifesting himself in a unique way through me. And I know I am not trying to be anyone else. So when I start to manifest who he's called me to be, and Dr. Shola does his, and you do yours, and, you, and we come together because of our security in our identity in God, there is unity. Because now I'm not intimidated. I actually celebrate the difference. I'm like, wow, I can't do that. I, I, I know God has blessed me, but I cannot do that. Because I can, I can appreciate the uniqueness. So the, the Acts church, they stepped into one accord because there was harmony amongst them. They had covenant relationship. I don't think we would have known anything as Pentecost if their relationships were not in order. So they weren't just praying. See, their hearts were okay with one another. When I pray with people, I often like to check that my heart is okay with them. I don't mean that they sound good and I sound good and they said amen to my prayer and I said amen to them. You could say amen to each other's prayers, but you're not together. You could be like, just like Dr. Shola kind of illustrated, you could be saying amen to someone's prayers, but your heart is throwing daggers at them. And this is one of the problems in the church. We don't understand our corporate anointing and its potential to dismantle the works of darkness in regions. And so the enemy easily infiltrates our ranks with offenses, competition, envy, jealousy, unforgiveness. And so when we come together, we may be in the same room, but we're not in one accord. In fact, we may even be praying fervently. Listen to this. The constitution of your community is more important than the fervency of your prayers. The constitution of your community as the ecclesia 
what each member of that ecclesia buys into as part of the covenant, what we agree to, to be part of this. That constitution is more important than how fervent you all pray. Because you can pray fervently, but if you don't have harmony, your authority is neutralized and you achieve nothing in the spirit. And the enemy is not scared because you're praying fervently. He's scared of you coming together at a heart level where my heart is okay with your heart. Your heart is okay with my heart. And then we come together and fuse together and begin to pray fervently. That's exactly what the devil doesn't want. So you notice when prayer groups start to get intense, oftentimes the enemy sows discord. Oh, I had a dream about this. But, and by the way, not every dream you get that's about someone is from the Lord. The enemy can also give you deceptive dreams. I had a dream and this person, da, 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 da. And before you know it, they've acted on it. They've not really sought the Lord to discern where that's come from. And all these sort of things have evolved and, all, you know, discord manifests. And the group is not able to maximize its impact in the spirit. The enemy is so scared of our corporate unity coming together in one heart. So he's going to keep fighting it. Because what he wants is discord. So when you play all those notes and there is no order to them, it doesn't sound nice to hearing. Sometimes we come together like this to worship and there's all sorts of issues in hearts against other people. So when we release our sound, the incense arising to heaven stinks to God. Because it's mixed with unforgiveness. It's mixed with envy. It's mixed with jealousy. It's mixed with lust. And when Lord, we praise you, we honor you, he's turning his face away. Because it, it's not pure. And Dr. Shola said this as well. What, what validates the altar is the priest offering the sacrifice on the altar. What causes the altar to be effective is the integrity of the priest servicing the altar. Your alignment with God, your heart alignment with God. Listen, there are times I know I can't pray because I've just had a disagreement with my wife. I don't know how some people think they can just have a disagreement and then just ascend. <laughs> I don't know where you're ascending to, but it's not the throne of God. In fact, after that disagreement, I know I've probably just added another 30 to an hour, 30 minutes to an hour to kind of recover from, yeah. <laughs> you know, apologize again. And I love that God has wired me in such a way that if things are not okay relationally, I can't function. I love that I'm wired, because I can't, it's like I'm shut down if we're not okay. So we always have to be okay, which means I value relational connections. So on my team, on my staff team, I'm saying to them, listen, I know I'm the boss, but listen, we're a spiritual ministry, so we got to learn to expose and deal with issues as they come up. So we're going to give no room to the enemy, no room whatsoever. What tends to happen in church is one person gets offended by something someone else has done. And you know, Matthew 18, the scripture was quoted. If your brother sins against you, the scripture says, you go to them. You go to, it didn't say you go to other people, which is what most people do. So, you know, you, you know, say I offend you. What tends to happen is the person that's offended will go to other people. Oh, you won't be, believe what they did. They did this. So let's just, let's just make, I don't know if the cameras can see me. Let's, let's, let's uh, have an illustration. Let's say my brother here, let's say I offend him. Okay. And he doesn't come to me, but he goes to you and tells you what's happened. And then he goes to you and tells you what's happened. Goes to you and tells you what's happened. What he's done is he's sown seeds. Now, you know when seeds are sown, they disappear for a while. <laughs> so, maybe I then have a conversation with him and we resolve the issue. Have you noticed, most likely, he's not going to go to you and tell you it's okay. Go to you, it's okay. Go to you, it's okay. So, we may have resolved, but those seeds have been sown. So six months down the line, I do something faintly similar to something he said. It waters that seed quickly. There's now a manifestation in your emotions against me. Because of what he said to you. 
So now you realize you have something you feel. Then you start chatting with him sometime after church, okay? And then I come up in the conversation. And then before you realize it, you're like, oh yeah, I felt the same thing. Now you've created a, you've created a stronghold. Because you have an evil emotion towards me, you have an evil feeling towards me, and you so by that conversation, you create a bonding in the spirit, and that becomes a landing strip for the enemy to release curses against me. Because now, your authority as the believer is being hijacked by the devil to use against me. Are, are you? I remember once I was, I was in a prayer meeting kind of setting. There was leaders in, in the city had gathered. A friend of mine had put this meeting on. And, you know, I have a good relationship with him, but, you know, it's not like we speak every day. After the meeting, I was leaving. And so he was greeting people at the door. And I greeted him at the door. And, you know, some of us prayer people are very sensitive. So to me, it felt like he was being weird. I was like... Is everything okay? In my head, I'm like, why is he acting a bit weird? Is everything okay? So I left the meeting feeling, what's going on? Like, something is just not right. Like, I don't know, maybe he's upset with me or maybe, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to just think this through. So I'm driving to somewhere, I don't know where, and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to deal with this right now. I'm not going to let these thoughts carry on. I'm going to call him. Hey, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Um, oh, it was a great meeting, wasn't it? Yes, it was a great meeting. I said, listen, this may just be me. But when I was leaving the meeting, I felt like that short interaction we had was just a bit awkward. And I left feeling like maybe there's something wrong. Is everything okay? You know what he said? James, I am just a socially awkward person. So whatever you are feeling Nothing is wrong. It's just I can be socially awkward. How many realize? <laughs> if I did not have that conversation, and then I went into another meeting and some leader mentions this guy, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember. Are you with me? So now, you remember what it says about we do not wrestle against flesh and blood? So what's that scripture in Corinthians? It talks about, you know, uh, imaginations and thoughts. Strongholds start to form in my mind and the enemy starts to work on me. And I don't even realize I'm submitting to the lies of the enemy. Because I never had the courage to just talk to the brother face to face. How many Christians are talking behind each other's back and I've not bothered to go to the person. Hey, I might be wrong, but I am feeling this. Can we just... Just that principle alone is shutting down many churches. We're praying fervently, but we're going nowhere in the spirit because our authority has been neutralized because of the discord in our midst. So you need to have an agreement. And part of my agreement with my team is we have zero tolerance for strife. Zero tolerance for strife. That's not to say I'm not going to offend you. Because any married couple here knows the closer you get, they were nice and you knew them from afar, you were dating and you are engaging. As you got closer, it doesn't matter how spiritual you are, there is now more room for you to step on each other's toes and offend each other, whether you want to or not. It's because you're just different people with different preferences. My wife likes to squeeze the toothpaste from the middle. I like to squeeze it from the bottom. It's a preference. It's not spiritual. It's a preference. So if that situation is not handled properly, we could end up in a disagreement about how the toothpaste should be handled. Are you with me? It's not a spiritual thing. It's just a natural, it's just a conversation. I prefer it this way. You prefer it that way. Now, if we don't handle that situation properly, demons will get involved. A natural preference difference becomes now a landing strip for demonic activity because there was no maturity to learn how to discern. Okay, this is just a matter of preference. Okay, let's just resolve this and give the enemy no room. You can do you or do me. In fact, let's get two different toothpaste. <laughs> this is mine, that is yours. 
Because I want to preserve unity. I have zero tolerance for strife. I'm not saying I expect us not to offend each other. I know I am human. You are human too. It means you have, you know, uh, you're not perfect. So the closer we get to you, the more we're going to see your imperfections. So we need to give grace to each other as we walk closely with each other to know that we are not perfect. So give room for things to come up and then have a way to resolve them in a way that it does not affect the corporate unity. Because if it does, then the corporate ranking and the spirit drops. And our shouting and prayer and we want to take over, we want God to move, it's now ineffective because we are not really, to, our hearts are not okay with each other. We may be praying the same prayer, but our hearts are not okay with one another. So, long of covers. That's true. So there are times when my brother could offend me. I hope I'm not prophesying here. So <laughs> we've not really met before. <laughs> I love your music though. That seems some years ago. <laughs> if my brother offends me in, in a certain way and I kind of take some time to reflect and I go, actually, it didn't really offend me. I was just triggered because of my baggage. Now I'm self-aware. He did something, but I don't think he meant it in the way he did. So I'm like, you know what, Lord? I need you to heal me from the issues I have with church leaders from my previous church. It's not him. It's just I'm, I'm reacting to something he did that just reminded me of some wounds from the past. Lord, I need healing. You see? So now I am asking the Lord to heal me. Because this is what happens. People who have unhealed wounds become openings for demonic activity to influence churches. And sometimes people become unaware. It's like, you know, if you have bad breath, sometimes you're the last person to know you've got it. Everyone feels the impact apart from you. It's the same way with wounds. You were hurt by your father. You were hurt by your last pastor. You were hurt by a friend that came in the same way. And so now, when anyone comes in that kind of way, you react without realizing. And the interesting thing is, when you've been hurt by a father, oftentimes God will use a father to bring the healing. When you've been hurt by a close friend, such a way, God will use the right version of that relationship to heal the perversion of, uh, are you hearing me? So if you shut yourself down, you might be missing out on the healing that God wants to bring your way. And so you got to realize the times when you experience offenses and it's not the person, it is you. So you need to be self-aware enough and be able to take it to God and go, Lord, I'm realizing I need healing. So you're going to just let it go. Love covers. So if love covers, what it means is six months down the line, I see my brother at the door and I should not be bringing up. Oh yeah, six months ago you wore a white shirt and you, you said this, you said this, you said it, and you know, I was offended. Are you with me? You never covered it. You never really let it go. Didn't the scripture say as far as the east is from the west? When God lets something go, it's gone. In the same way, when people offend you and you know that that is a law of covers moment, you truly let it go. I don't mean you hold it somewhere to bring up a few months down the line. You truly let it go. Now, our personality types kind of vary in that there's some people that their default posture is to let it go. But they've not really let it go. It's just piling up for explosion further down the line. <laughs> so you need to know that. You're saying, oh yeah, I'm going to let it go. I'm like, but no, 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 you haven't let it go. Because whenever you see them... It, your emotions are stirred. It means there's still stuff to deal with. So love covers, but this is the other part. Love confronts. If you have offended me, and I know it's, I know it's not a love covers moment because now when I see you, I can't get over it. When I see you, it's, I, I'm feeling it. So I cannot just go, you know, I'm just going to let this go. I'm just going to talk to God about it and let it. No, no, no. We, we need to now resolve it. Are you with me? So Matthew 18 says, you go to your brother, you tell him, if he doesn't listen, then you bring someone else into the same conversation. If they don't listen and there's no result, you tell it to the church. I don't know if 
the church generally has actually ever followed that principle. Because there's also a final step. Do you know what the final step is? If he doesn't listen, you have to treat that person like a heathen. You know what that means? They cannot be part of the congregation anymore. Why is it that strict? Think about it. It's because that person is going to affect the corporate unity and the harmony in the room. If someone is preaching and you have an evil emotion towards them, like when I'm speaking, if you have a bad feeling towards me, I don't have to know it, but I can feel it. Because from that emotion, the enemy can use you to be releasing curses at me as I'm speaking. So I could be speaking and battling resistance. Because there are people in the room that feel evil towards me. And they're looking at me, but their hearts are not really. So the enemy uses that open door to strike. Are, are you hearing me? So without you realizing it, you can become an agent or your double agent. You're praising the Lord one moment, the next moment the enemy has hijacked your evil emotions and is using you to strike the pastor. And sometimes you go to meetings, you can just feel the opposition. You can feel the resistance. It's because people's hearts are pushing. And now whoever is ministering has a lot to battle through to break through into that. Because the people's hearts are not there. I'm telling you, church, we can talk about prayer all day, but if we don't understand this principle of walking in harmony, our effectiveness is neutralized. But this is what heaven is wanting. He's wanting to raise up an army that will not back out. An army that understands their position on the wall. An army that knows how to advance collectively together. There is no other way for the church. And when you look at the book of Acts as a wrap-up, you see that all through the book of Acts, especially in the earlier parts, it emphasizes they were in one accord. They were in one accord. They were in one accord. They prayed and the building shook. They were in one accord. They prayed and the fire fell from heaven, Pentecost. Different examples of them being all together in one accord. Church, when we begin to step into this reality, the power and the authority that starts to manifest in our meetings will, will be way beyond just the anointing of a person. There is a dimension we can pull down that goes beyond one person's anointing because we've stepped. Didn't it say in Chronicles that the, the, the musicians and the singers... And you see what happened? The glory came when they were together. Mind you, they were also 120, which reminds me of Acts 2. What happened in Acts 2, another way to name what happened in Acts 2 is the effects of covenant praying. Because they were in covenant with one another in relationship. They were in covenant with God. Their hearts were tuned into the Lord. And that level of connection, their sacrifice to pray until... There are many components that come together to make that, that prayer really powerful. I'm convinced that if we want to see God move, we need to step into the sim, a similar type of commitment. And we need to have a similar value system like the early church did. We want the quick fix. We want the, just one meeting wonder and everything is over. But the Lord is wanting longevity. He's wanting relationship. He's wanting honor, mutual honor of one another. Not just honoring the pastor, not honoring your husband. <laughs> mutual honor of one another. And in that place, I believe we can step into dimensions of the manifestation of God that will bring deliverance to our communities. Do you understand with me? I think we need to pray. Um, before I came up, I was just reflecting on an experience I had in London some years ago. And before we pray about unity, I think we're going to pray about this, and then we're going to pray into, uh, you know, the unity thing. I was speaking at a church here in London. It was a big meeting, and I stayed in a hotel room. Uh, and when I got to that hotel room, 
um, after praying and going to sleep, I had an experience where a certain spirit visited me in that hotel room. Long story short, I knew it was Jezebel. And in the dream, I released the fire of God against this spirit and it disintegrated in front of me. And then I woke up and I knew that something significant had just happened because of what happened next in the meeting after that experience. Why am I sharing that? Because I believe there's some of you in this room that have been tormented in your dreams. And the enemy has been coming to manipulate, to intimidate you in the dreams. But you cannot release the fire of God against the enemy in your dreams if you're not while you're awake walking in that fire. The fervency of your spirit while you're asleep is determined by the fervency of your spirit while you're awake. If we say, let's pray, and you're just folding your arms, your spirit is deactivated. There's no, so when you go to sleep, don't be surprised if, if the enemy is chasing you as opposed to you chasing him. And what I'm trying to say is we're going to go into a moment of prayer, and I want you to engage your whole being. Okay, not casual British prayer now. If you want to even pray in your Yoruba language, you know, whatever. Get into your mode. And part of what we're praying is, Lord, I, want, I don't want to be connected to wounds of the past. I don't want to be connected to things in my bloodline that's limiting my effectiveness in ascending in the spirit and serving you effectively right now. So Father, let there be a cleansing. Let there be a purging. Let there be a healing of every residue from the past, residue of hurts, residue of pain, residue of wrong ideologies, strongholds in my mind, lies that I have believed as truth, deception that is camouflaging itself as truth, that which is functioning unchallenged in my, in my life. Well, right now, I say, let there be light. I expose it to you. I turn away from perversion. I turn away from deception. I turn away from manipulations of the enemy. No more. No more. Haye. Asamalandayasas. Evatolanamande kalanas. Eviosis, Eviosis, Imanda Catalana Mandus, Ibailo Sivi Catalanes, Ebaya, Ebaya, cleanse my soul from every contamination. Purge my soul from every offense, from every bitterness. I repent of unforgiveness. I repent. Purge my soul. Aleos y mando navalas, avalana manda lejayas, eva, 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 yas. Aye, 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 aye. Don't stop, come on. Hasana mando kapaleasas, ivalando se vaila navantos. Ayakataila ne mandas, ibaila ne mando luvasos, e katala neas, ivalana neas. Avaleos y taila namandus e ba e vaya nandas aye purge cleanse cleanse every inward toleration of the spirit of the age every inward toleration of offense every inward toleration of unforgiveness bitterness Jezebel immorality every inward toleration of envy of idolatry every inward toleration of darkness purge it purge it purge it purge it Aye. Asylas, Imandas, Ekailas, Ipatula Namba Cotones, Eveas, Ayayayayaya, Aye Sunamandas, Evai Sunamandas, Evai Conanandas, Evai Tulinandas, Avale no Capalas, Evalanas, Evalanas, give us pure hearts, pure hearts, no guile. No, no, no offense. Ah! Spirit of God, we welcome your cleansing by the blood of Jesus. We welcome your decontamination of our soul. Aye! 
Jesus. As we're praying, I feel like there's some people here. What you're dealing with in your body as sickness is connected to unforgiveness. Let it go. The Lord wants to heal you as you let go of that unforgiveness. Forgiving them is not condoning what they did. Release that emotion to the Lord. Lord, I choose to forgive. I choose to let go. What was done was not right. It was not just. It was an act of injustice. But the Lord is wanting to heal you as you forgive and you let go. Yes, Lord. Jesus. 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 Just want to pray one last prayer and I want to hand over. There's sometimes what affects corporate unity is people that have fallen in love with their wounds and the demons that have been associated with those wounds are now, they're not even aware. They, they have come into agreement with a spirit. So here's a prayer I want us to pray. Any agreement have come into with any other spirit, knowingly or knowingly, the spirits that do not represent the agenda of heaven, let those agreements and soul ties be broken now. We break it off now. Every agreement with any other spirits, especially spirits representing, representing the agenda of darkness, any agreement in my soul, Father, let it be cut off. The soul ties broken off. Expose and expel them. Expose and expel them by fire. Right now, by fire. By fire. In the name of Jesus. Je get the body, get the body. Je get the body, Je get the body, get the body. Je get the body, get the body, get the body. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You know, as as the James was mentioned, I mean. Some of the things that he said were very simple but very profound. Very simple but very profound. And when I say pro the profundity of the thing is not so much in, you know, when, as the person, it's when it is relevant. When it is relevant. Let me, let me, I don't know, how can I explain this? What God was showing me, even as he, he was talking, is that, you know, it's almost like as though the things that we want to see happen in our lives, they are actually right next to us. But when the Bible says that your prayers may not be hindered, it means that, remember um, 21 days of Daniel's prayer, and the guy was there, and it was, the angel was stuck 
until his own was about consistency. Then, the, but many of us, our prayers are hindered by the offense, by the issues, the unfor, you know. And I will just use the, a, a, a little one example so that we can use that to pray. We're going to spend the next ten or so fifteen minutes to pray these things through because for somebody, as we just pray these prayers, you're going to begin to see the answers come. Because the angels have been sent. It's only that they've been hindered. You know, you'll be amazed. Some of you, you don't know, they say, God's actually sent you to a church for a purpose. And you are there, but that purpose is not fulfilled because there's an offense you brought there. I don't know if this is making sense. There, 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 there's a, you know, I'll, I'll give an example. So remember the example I gave about the lady, the, the sacrifice and the kotonu. Her husband had actually brought her from another church. She was, you know, very involved in that church. So she wasn't, you know, she came to this church because her husband said she should come. And she'd been coming for weeks and, you know, she, she wasn't really, you know, in a, this is not really my church. This is not my, really my church. The long story short is that I asked myself, when was the day that God opened my eyes to see the issue concerning her life, where the sacrifice was made. It was when her heart was in agreement with this church. And I'm not using this to try to preach a doctrine about the church. Does that make sense? I'm using that to say that there was just something going on in her heart. Does that make sense? But the moment she connected, I said, this is my pastor. Now, this is somebody coming from her, another church, which is legitimate. Now, can you imagine... You, something happened. The pastor said something. He said, the pastor spoke about me there. Or, oh, it's it sounding like the other. Do you understand? And you are offended at something. You know what? You may not tell the pastor that, but you are disconnected. Is this making sense? And it's not even just about, you know, he said, many. it's not just about the pastoral relationship. We, we are supposed to be, draw life from each other. There is something about, Offense that that dismantles, for want of a better word, the, the 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 real track that God is using to bring your blessing to you. So I want us to pray honestly, and if this is the only prayer that I will pray, I'm telling you, you are going to begin to see certain things fall in place. There are some of you; it is an offense against your parent. There are some of you. You know, they are, they are key relationships. And that, that's why I said simple message but really profound. Simple message but really profound. You gave the example of the, you went to preach somewhere. How many times have we made assumptions that, oh, that person worked for, uh, they are, this is what they are thinking. And all of that stuff. And so I want you to spend the first few minutes of this prayer, scanning your mind about people you've already put in boxes. Especially the people who, are, so if it is the bus driver, you know, someone, I, mean, I don't like the, his, the look on his face. All, you, you, when next he comes, just don't get into his bus. That's it. You know, but there, but there are some people, if it's the Uber driver, when he comes and you find out that you're still, but there's people who you have to deal with on a regular basis. Is, is this making sense? And listen to this. The, 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 the enemy's strategy is to ensure that you don't enter into the fullness of God. And so I want you to pray. The first prayer is a scanning prayer where you're going to begin, Lord who has offended me? Who am I offended? So can you do that? And the, I, I, it is a hindrance. It is a hindrance. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me. How do I deal with it? How do I address it? Do I need to talk to them? Mantorobara satakata. Open your mouth and pray. Mantorobara bada. What is that hindrance? Mantoke paratis. Open your mouth. Open your mouth and say, Lord, help me. Help me. Help me in this area. How do I address this thing? How do I manto seke parabato so paras rebato? Because it is a hindrance man toke paranta mintu so parabados vik e prato so para. Help me, Lord. Help me to deal with this matter. Help me to give me the wisdom to address it. 
The same way Pastor James called that gentleman and said, is there, is there, is there, I, are you upset? I said, no, I, I'm just awkward with relationships. Lord, help me to resolve this matter. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. The second prayer we're going to pray, because all of this is leading to something, is we want to deal with wounds. We want to deal with wounds. Where I'm going to is really to deal with bloodline issues that are repeated in our lives. Yeah, to, I want to, I'm leading to so that we can deal with some heavy stuff, yeah, before we leave this place. But we can't deal with those things with us having common issues with the enemy we are trying to deal with. Does this make sense? And so, what are the wounds? What are the things that trigger you easily? What are the, what are, you know, look at your life and think, you know, you have a problem, you had this problem in the last place of work. You also have this problem in this present place. And you are complaining about this same thing with, with this boss. So is there not a commonality somewhere? Is this making sense? You had this issue with this sister. Now you're having this issue with this sister. Now you're having this issue with this uh, another sister. And you've looked, the, the, common, the common thing, the common denominator is who? You. And if we don't address that part, that Satan has put that thing as a landmine to, as it were, keep you from entering into something. So I want us to pray that that thorn, that thing, Lord, help us see it for what it is. That is the trap of the enemy. Open your mouth and begin. Say, Lord, that thing, that thing, that's the trigger. Help me grow past this point. Help me grow past this point. Mato keparanta sikede. Sekedegal, that thing that is keeping me from the best of relationships, man torobaras. Help me grow past this point, man torobarasikete paratisi, rosoto kare barata. Help me grow past this point, man torobaros, ze etes keparanta, man torobarata sikete paros, mesuto keparanta, resata katapa. Help me grow past this point where I keep falling, where I keep tripping over where I keep messing up, where it makes me start all over again, where it makes me move to another church, where it makes me go, go into another relationship. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And then the, the last prayer, one prayer point I'm going to take before we pray that main prayer is James 5.16. Confess your trespasses to one another. I think James mentioned that, didn't he? Uh, before that prayer of Elijah prayed, what did he, does he say? He says, Elijah, Elijah was a man with like passions. This is how he says, the scripture before that says, confess your trespasses to one another. So you want to pray like Elijah prayed? And see, pray, he says, before you pray that prayer, confess your trespasses. To who? One another. Some of us are going to go and need, uh, need to go and tell somebody after I say, look, you know, I've been feeling like this towards you. I've been upset. I've, I've not been happy that you bought that car. <laughs> I'm not, no, of course I'm not. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, some of us need to, you know, I'm, I've not been happy with you. Does this make sense? It says, or, or, or you confess that I'm the one that said those bad things about you. I'm the one that so, 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 so. And, you know, I actually stole your, so, so, you know, that, that kind of thing. I believe something is going to happen after. It says, confess your trespasses to one another and do what? Pray for one another. Tell somebody, it says, confess your trespass first. Before we start praying for one another. Before you start holding my hand in agreement, what have you done? <laughs> Hallelujah. What have you said? And then it says, and then that you may be what? Healed. Which means when we don't do this, some of us may remain sick. God forbid. The effect, then he says, then the effective fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. 
Father, Lord, give me the grace after this meeting to begin to actually now begin to tell people the honest things in my heart. To help to, 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 speak, to speak the truth in love. Can we say this prayer? Can we say this prayer before we start praying the dangerous prayers that are going to shift things? Father, Lord, help. Help. Have mercy. Lord, help me say the truth about how I feel or how I felt. And let the other person be able to actually speak and say, I didn't mean this. I didn't, I actually didn't feel this. And so that the devil does not take the last glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. Are you sure you prayed all these prayers sincerely? You're sure? You're sure? You're sure? Okay, because we are now going to pray. We are now going to pray. You see, the prayers we just prayed weaken demonic strongholds. And if you don't, that, that, that's why sometimes when we do deliverance, the, 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 the deliverance doesn't happen. Why? Because the demon says that well, she still has this. He still has that. Okay? So, I am assuming you did it well. So, we're going to pray. Lift up your right hand wherever you are. Because after tonight's meeting, your prayers are going to be different. Your prayers are going to avail much. Making much power available. Tremendous in its working. Lift up your right hand. Say, in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare... I am born again. I am blood washed because I, I believe and confess that Jesus Christ came to die for me. He took my place of, of, of sin that I may become righteous. He took the curse upon me that I may become blessed. He was crucified. He died, was buried, rose again on the third day. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for me. I believe and confess that when he was crucified, died, buried, raised again, I was crucified with him. I died with him. I rose again with him. Now I am seated at the right hand of the Father where I also make intercession. I decree and declare no demonic power in hell or on earth has dominion over me. Jesus Christ disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them on the cross. Therefore, I decree and declare every bloodline curse Every bloodline iniquity, every bloodline infirmity, I decree and declare it is finished. Your power is neutralized. Whomsoever the sun sets free is free indeed. In the name of Jesus, I, I dislodge witchcraft, I dislodge divination. I dislodge every curse, every bloodline iniquity trying to perpetuate itself in my bloodline, in my life, every strong man trying to oppress me from every, any evil altar. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare, I am free, I am free. I am free. Open your mouth and begin to pray. Mantoro bada bada bada. Every demonic spell, every enchantment, incantation, maroto parabatopa, oppressive, mantoro boro boro bada. Bewitchment over my life, over my family, over my mind. Every oppression, depression, rebato soto, suppression of the enemy, rebato koparaba. Robakata Deba, Robata Kata, 
Robata, we release the fire of the Holy Ghost. Makto Robata, Merosoto Para, Rekato Parabados, Rata Sakata, Robataka, Rebato Poro, Mentorobos, Jegeba, Mantorobo, Mesuto Para, Jegeba, Jegele, Roboto Paraba, Mantoro Barabade, Jeke Parabado, Mantoro Barasi, Roboto Parabada, Mantoro Barabada, Jeke Parai, Rosso Para, Ropa Aika Aika A, Roboto Sopa, Jeke Paranto, Jeke Para, Ropo Papa, Ropapa, Ropopo, Ja Aika, Jeke Paros, Jeke. Ropopopa. Ropopopana. Zopopa Katasi. Zoporoporopo. Rekapa Topara. Rata Kahai. Shekepara. Shekeparos. Matorobara. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. I want us to be out of here in a short while, yeah, but this, you know. I really thank God for the hand of God upon uh, James's life. What he shared, like that seems simple, eh, was, <laughs> it's like surgery. It opened up something that opened up a valve. So in the next few minutes, we're going to deal with some stuff because the heavens are open now. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So the part you're in the choir, in it? As we were praying now, I don't know what it is you said in your prayers, but he opened up something into your family. And the Lord said, I eat a bread to super. There is, there is a siege against your family, a demonic siege against your family. See, as we're praying for her, you, you, know, we, they, they, you know, we can't prophesy to everybody, but hold on, you can't prophesy to everybody, and, but stay in the same spirit of, of, of prayer. But the issue is that when God is speaking to one, it means that that is what he's addressing. Does that make sense? There's a demonic siege against your family, yeah, that has come against your family. And the, 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 the plot and the plan is to take one out, take another one out, take another Now, what will surprise you is that there is something that in, in your, fam, your bloodline that is coming for, for supposed someone. And the Lord said, pray that this thing doesn't touch somebody in your family, you know, when they turned 17, 17, how many, how many, how many people in your family? How many children? We're three. How old is the first? Who's the first? I'm the first. Who's the second? My brother. How old? He is 23. How old is the first one? My sister, she's 17. 16, going on 17 this year. How old? 16. When will she be 17? De de December. So how many months ago? About nine months to go. Now, what I'm saying is that if the Spirit of God revealed that to me and it wasn't revealed by man, how many of you know the Spirit of God is here and, and he, he's, he's active? And, so we're using her as a point of contact and, and for you as well. Now, and we're doing this in a few minutes. So it's not about her. It is about what God is doing here. You are praying for your family and members of your family. Any hex any plots, anything that we, this year that, is, that the enemy is trying to orchestrate to manifest itself, open your mouth and begin to pray. Resata, release bitterness. Rekapatoso paraba. Sheke paros. Rebatoso paraba. Sheke deba. Robar. O parata sike, roboto paraba, roboto ke paranta, roboto so parabaras, se e paroto soko, mato soko paras, viva to so para, se ke paro, robaraba, se de banaba, robata kate paros, viva rata sike pa, 
Roboto popo. Papa 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 papa. Papa reka tatise. Roboto parabados. Reboto sopara. Ranta katatasi. Va ai parotoso. Zoto pala. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen. Yeah, the next prayer we're going to pray. We'll have a few minutes. You know, when we teach about altars, we talk about that altars are like landing strips. You know what a landing strip is? When a plane, if a plane wants to land, if it can't find a landing strip, it will, it will move. I remember we're coming back, was it you and I, from Ukraine, city airport. <laughs> you know, as you're landing city, it's a very small, you know, the wind was so what The plane was about to land and it missed the strip and and he, I mean, it was scary. He had to take off again. And this is the same way, you know. The Bible says, a curse, costless, and shall not alight. Yeah. So this thing was, was looking to land on, on your sister. Yeah. But what the Lord opened my eyes to say is to pray, ask people to pray that a curse will come. It talks about, I will visit the iniquities upon the children to the fall. But listen to this. If there's no landing strip, there will be no place to land. So I want us to remove every form of legitimacy of, for that altar. That any, any area of our lives that has, been, that has been open or cannot further for the enemy, that it will not land in our lives. Wherever the enemy... We are praying. Rotopaka, Roboto Parabada, Karato Soporoboro, Segede, Roboto Paracate, Zopacati Para, Jet Eparanta, Manto Robaros, Jet Eparaba, Manto Roboros, Soke Paraba, Jetede, Jetedeba, Jetede, Robotopo, Robodos, Robotisede, my life will not be a landing strip for the enemy. My life will not be a landing strip for the enemy. There will be no landing place. Manto Robotopa, Manto Padadis, Zopataka, Zopade, Zakade, open your mouth and pray. Mantopa, Ropopo, Rakata, Rabadaba, Shekedeba, Oh, Padaba, Santa Gale, Zedebados, Zedebados, Zedebada, Mantoroba, Mantoroba, Mantoroba. Open your mouth and pray. Robo Papa, Rebada, Jeke Padaba, Robato Suko. Open your mouth, Voto Sike, Rabados, Robados, Zedebados, Jeke Deba, Jeke Debados. Oski Parabadon. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want to also use, you know, some quick things that we'll do before we, we close. If you have had any kind of dream encounters in recent times, especially since these teachings on altars and things have been happening all around, yeah, and it's like, like the kind of things I'm talking about, and it's like, wow, this is strange, this is out, yeah, wherever you are. Put up your hand and then come forward. Yeah? Okay? Come forward quickly. Quickly, 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 quickly. Come forward quickly. Man, Toru Badasi take a day. So what has happened is that those things are always there. Wow, all of you, you know, but the spirit realm has now opened to you. Ma uke te paratasa. Man, to soke pa. Man, tarabara si teke. Man, to soke paratasi kede. Man, to soke de. Wow. All of you, are you sure? Why were you, initially I thought, it, I only saw about 15 people. So why were you all being funky? <laughs> Which of you here has a connection with, I mean, I, I don't know if it's like a family, something to do, in Italy, there's a part of Italy. Oh, what's the, I'm trying to look for the name now. It's a bit near Florence, that area. Eh? Not Tuscany. Not, so not Tuscany, there's another part. Not Venice. Okay, who has a connection with that? 
somewhere in Italy. Yeah? Which way? What, what's the area? Huh? What's the name of the what's the name of the okay? Huh? Lecomo, no, no. Okay. Father Lord, visit these people, wherever it is. Yeah. Visit these people. Help these people. Yeah. Father Lord, in the name of Jesus. So I'm praying for all these people. We, those of you who've had these encounters that I'm talking about, just lift up your hands wherever you are. And, and in the name of Jesus, Lord, anoint their hands. Anoint their hands. Anoint their hands. Anoint their hands. In fact, Lord, anoint them now. Let there be fresh fire on the altar. Lord, energize their prayer life from tonight. That whenever next they have the dreams in the name of Jesus, they will be victorious in the dream. Open your mouth and begin to pray. I want and we are praying for everybody under the sound of my voice. Marco to Paraba. As you consecrate yourself, Rekapato Supal. Pray for fresh fire on the altar. Fresh fire. Makupare tesikede. Jeke pala. Rokopo pale. Ma eparoto para. Jeke para. Roboto pares. Seke paruto. Oh, fresh fire. Fresh fire. Lord. Ropa takada. Seke teke teke de. Let the fire of God consume every demonic spirit showing up in our dreams. We brata sike para showing up in our dreams. Reka patoso showing up in our dreams. I release the fire of the Holy Ghost. The fire we break witchcraft. 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 I curse you to your roots, you foul spirit. I release the fire of God on your altar. You spirits of death, suicide. I curse you to your roots. I curse you to your roots. Every oppressive spirit, we curse you to your roots. We curse you to your roots. Fire, 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 fire. Fire, 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 in the name of Jesus. So repeat after me, in the name of Jesus. Tonight, I decree and declare, even as the scripture says, even as the scripture says, that he will visit the consequences of the sin or the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the fourth and the uh, th third and fourth generation. Now I want you to do this. Say, in the name of Jesus, I shut the door to the visitation of any consequence of the sin or the acts of my forebears in my life. Now, I shut the door. Now, open your mouth and begin to pray. Man, toro bada bada bada. Ma toke pale. Peluto porobo. Man, toro bada. I shut the door. You have no entry point into my life. I refuse you permission to enter my life, to oppress, to harass. I shut the door on you. I shut the door. I shut the door. Ropa katapa. Ropa papa. Ropa papa katas. Zoporo para. Zopara tise. Sopora de Cadiz. Oh, Bratisa Kebaraba. I shut the door. 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 
I shut the door. I shut the door. I shut the door. I shut the door. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Who, who has a connection with, um, where's Manila? Where's Manila? Philippines. Who has a connection with uh, the Philippines? Manila, Philippines. Who's, um, Dami, what's your connection? Huh? What did she say? Base there. Oh, you're here? How is that possible? Come forward. <laughs> so, the place in, is, is there a place in Italy like Rose, you start with Rose, something like that? Huh? Huh? I think it's in the south. I think, where, where do they have the movies thing? The, the something like the first thing. Huh? I, I, see, I'll find it. I'll locate it. Don't worry. No. Okay. We're going to close now. We're going to close now. There's a name like Agrelius. I don't know. It's spelled A G something, 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 something. And it's something like that. Who has a connection? What's Agrelius? What's Ag No, no, no. This is like a girl, something, something. It's almost, it almost sounds like Spanish. I don't know. Aguilera or something like that. There's somebody God wants me to pray for before we leave. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what's it? What did she say? What did she say? Randy what? I'll find it. Even if it means me coming back some other time because we are going to close now. Father Lord, in the name of Jesus, that arrow that was shot to hit whoever this person is, we say it will not find its target. Amen. It will not find its target. Amen. It will not locate its target. Amen. Lord, as your people leave this place today, Give them the, 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 the warrior anointing. Yeah. Let them live with fire in their bones. They came, they might have come in, in with bottles as babies, but let them live with a battle-ready spirit yeah. to contend with the enemy. Yeah. Lord, I'm praying by your spirit that these ones will not fall, become casualties yeah. because they will not live casually. Release, we release the grace for consecration Amen. over the lives of your people. Amen. Do what only you can do. Amen. Do the phenomenal. Open their eyes as they go. Give them victory in the place of battle. Amen. And that Father Lord, at the, at the, at in, the, in not too long from now, Lord, these ones will come out victorious. Amen. Turn all their tests into testimonies. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, give the Lord a powerful hand clap. Can we take a, an, an offering before we leave? Is that okay? Yeah? Even if you say no, it's okay. Let's bring out our offering quickly. Let's do that quickly and then we'll just, yeah. Um, the, the, the plan was to take it to 10. I don't think we should. I think we should just, just let everybody go home and, you know, catch the, the, the train. Sit down and let's take our offering. Hallelujah. Were you blessed tonight? Can you please appreciate uh, Pastor James? I appreciate, I appreciate. Don't hate, don't hate, I appreciate. And Pastor James, when I grow up, I want my hair to be like yours. I, I, I'm jealous, you know, because I've tried all I can. Nothing can grow here. I don't know why. So I think you might have to lay hands on me. Uh, <laughs> you seem to have extra. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let's, well, it, at the Liberty Church, we, we give in various ways. Um, you can give digitally, but there are other, you, we also still take cash. Um, as in, our, um, so if you want to give by, um, through um, 
physical means, there are envelopes, and then there are different. I don't see you giving. Some people are just looking. Uh, yeah, the truth of the matter is that, you know, the program is already paid for, but then the issue is what is your sacrifice? What is speaking for you? You want a fire, prayer, altar, then maybe this is the place to give a sacrifice so that you can, you can receive, you know, um, an unusual prayer mantle. Hallelujah. Amen. And God will surprise you. There's somebody in this place God is going to surprise in a big way. All right. Have we done that? So if we have, let's just, uh, are, are you done? Okay, finish it up. Don't worry. I'll use you as my temperature gauge. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Let's appreciate Sounds of Liberty. Once again, appreciate uh, Evans and Purist. Oh boy. How old is your baby now? Do you have two now? Jesus. Or is there a third one? Maybe, maybe James should, should lay hands on you and then you might just move to the four level. <laughs> Wow. How long did you wait for a child for again? Seven years, and God has given you two already. Amen. Anybody here who is believing God for children, we pray the same grace will come upon you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, Didi, your, your daughter, there's an extraordinary anointing coming upon her for academic excellence. She's going to be distinguished. There's a way she's smiling that is extra. <laughs> uh, God bless you. I see her receiving awards Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Are we good? Let's stand up as we pray. Amen. Oh, yes. Pastor Bims, please quickly come and say hello to the first timers and then we close. Praise the Lord. We know that there are lots of people who are worshiping with us for the first time. Um, tonight, and we just wanted to let you know that TLC meets here for service every single Sunday, but not only here, at three other locations. So we meet in Croydon, we meet in Canary Wharf in East London, and we meet in St. John's Wood in North London. All four locations meet at 10 a.m. and at noon, so two services at either uh, or, or any of those four locations. If you don't belong to Bible Believing Church, We'd really love you to worship with us again. We'd love to see you again on Sunday. And if you're a first-timer, and for some reason you didn't answer the first-timer's call, maybe you were shy or you didn't want to miss Pastor James, um, there is still time for you to be hosted and to receive your gift. So um, if you fall into that category, please make your way into the vestibule. That's the little room on the uh, backside of this hall the follow-up team will be there to uh, meet and greet you. God bless you. Thank you very much. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us here now and forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Give somebody a ride um, to the station, home, or whatever. God bless you.